Topical questions. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17170 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the timetabling of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. Can I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 17170 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next item is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at Stage 2, that is SP Bill 29A, the Marshall List and the grouping of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. And members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak button as soon as possible after I call the group. So, members shall now refer to the marshalled list and we start with Group 1, which is the further increase in the age of criminal responsibility and of prosecution, age and timetable for increase. I call Amendment 1 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. At this point, I would advise members that Amendments 1 and 2 are direct alternatives. I would also draw members' attention to the information in the groupings on the other direct alternatives in this group. Alex Cole Hamilton to move Amendment 1 and to speak all uh, amendments in this group. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak to the amendments in this group, which I move in my name. Can I start by paying tribute to Alison McInnes, my friend and colleague, who pushed for progress on this issue in the last Parliament. She met with SNP obstruction in her efforts, similar to that which I fear I will meet again today. Presiding Officer, speaking during Stage 1 evidence of a different bill, the Equal Protection Bill, currently before this Parliament, Gillian Van Turnhout, a former Irish Senator, said something which I think has resonance with our proceedings today. In speaking of her successful efforts to end physical punishment in Ireland, she told us that she went into the chamber not knowing that, even if she, knowing that even if she was the only person to say that it is okay, not okay to hit a child, children in Ireland would know that somebody in a position of authority was on her side. I on their side. I recognise those words today. And if my party and the Minister's predecessor, Mark MacDonald, and a handful of others from other parties are the only ones to vote for a further increase in the age of criminal responsibility this afternoon to at least the international minimum, then children in Scotland will know that there are people in authority on their side. Yeah, yeah. The progress of this bill has been characterised by some very public and unprecedented interventions from the international community expressing an imperative for us to get to at least 14 and further still. This was a view shared by the clear majority of witnesses who gave evidence to our committee. Indeed, the day after our stage one debate, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child revised General Comment 10 to lift the global minimum to 14 years old. This was spelled out to our committee in no uncertain terms by a member of the UN Committee in oral evidence. Separately, the Human Rights Commissioner of the European Council, Dunia Majotovic, wrote to the Minister expressing in the strongest terms possible that Scotland should use this legislative opportunity to get to 14 immediately. The Minister's response, presiding officer to the Commissioner, was nothing short of an international embarrassment. By pointing to Scotland's unique children's hearing system, she sought to lean on a sense of perceived exceptionalism. The Commissioner's reply offered her very short shrift. Each national system is unique, she said, but nobody gets a pass. In resisting stage one calls for further uplift, the Minister also cited a need to carry the people of Scotland with us. But our further call for views at stage two revealed 86% of respondents supported further uplift to 14 and even 16. Put simply, if you're waiting for the people to come with us on this Minister, then they are already here. On my amendments to increase the ACR to 16, I want to say this. We simply cannot be the best place in the world to grow up if we aim for and subsequently miss the bare minimum international standard of expectation in this area. We have spent decades coalescing around the view that 16 is the point at which you should be credited with the wisdom to choose who you marry or share a bed with, whether you leave home and who represents you in this parliament. 
Presiding officer, either you have mental capacity to understand the consequences of your actions or you do not. The government's position on the age of majority is wholly incongruous. Yeah, yeah. The government have also argued that there is a capacity problem here for going further than 12. Indeed, the First Minister referred to the sheer volume of cases that would move from the courts to the children's panels. Presiding officer, we know, thanks to clarification from the Lord Advocate, that this sheer volume of 12 to 14 year olds being tried in adult courts amounts to a grand total of 11 individuals a year. Now, I accept that additional change may be required in the children's hearing system to accommodate these cases. This was identified by the children's reporter, who also support an uplift to 16, and the Lord Advocate. Several evidence sessions have suggested that these amount to post-18 powers for children's panels and a shift in the burden of proof between the balance of probabilities and beyond reasonable doubt for the most egregious cases. This is why Amendments 3, 6, 7 and 8 in my name offer Parliament a sunrise clause that would re-establish the working group and see commencement of a further uplift to 14 or 16 via a vote in this Parliament if needs be in early 2021. I refuse to accept that that is not enough time. This is a parliament that passed the EU Continuity Act in three days. I refuse also to accept that the changes such an uplift will require are beyond the capabilities of ministers and stakeholders in the 22 months my amendments afford. If there is a political will, so to do. I do not, however, believe that such a will exists, sadly. Presiding officer, without these amendments, the international community will judge this government as a failure on children's rights. History will also judge it likewise, but more importantly, so too will the children of young and young people of this country, and I do not blame them. I move the amendments in my name. Thank you very much. I could I call the Minister Marie Todd to speak to Amendment 145 and the other amendments in this group. Presiding officer, most of Mr Cole Hamilton's amendments in this group were previously lodged and debated at stage two. In response to this, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee scheduled two additional evidence sessions to hear the implications of raising the age above 12 through this bill from the Lord Advocate, Solicitor General, Crown Office and the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration. These experts were clear on the importance of carefully scoping and analysing the implications of moving to a higher age. It's worth noting that following this additional evidence taking session, the committee's position on the age did not change. So in response to those broadly similar amendments today, I want to make three clear points. First, the measures in part four of this bill have been developed to take account of the very small number of recorded incidents of significant harm that involve children under 12. The scale and impact of harmful behaviour involving children aged 12 to 15 is significantly greater. The part four measures would require further scrutiny and consideration before we would be in a position to implement such a higher age. There is also the likelihood, as was set out at stage two, of the need for additional primary legislation. The effect, presiding officer, would be that raising the age from eight could be delayed for a number of years. Even with the so-called sunrise clauses envisaged by Mr Cole Hamilton, significant work would require to be undertaken even before these could safely be commenced. I do not think that anyone in this chamber would welcome that. Mr Cole Hamilton... Certainly. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Minister for uh, taking an intervention on that point. We took no stage one evidence to suggest there should be any delay for commencement of the age of criminal responsibility of 12 from the date of royal assent. At no point did anybody say this uh, would set us back. Yet I know because I've had to lodge commencement amendments that this is something the government are going to spring on us. We may delay this implementation by a year. Will she speak to that now? Minister. Um, no, I won't respond to that now because, as you well know, you've lodged amendments which relate to that particular issue and we'll discuss it later on in the bill. At the moment, I'll focus on the amendments in this grouping. Mr Cole Hamilton's amendments 6 and 7 propose that the ministers increase the age of criminal responsibility by way of regulation. 
That is, without any additional primary legislation coming before this Parliament that might be needed in this regard. That does not feel like an appropriate procedure for such a significant reform. Secondly, Mr Cole Hamilton's amendments 9, 10, 11 and 12 seek to raise the age of criminal prosecution. There has been no real debate at any stage of the bill process on this proposal, not least from Mr Cole Hamilton himself. Again, making such a change requires careful and considered deliberation. That is not to say that we might not in the future agree as a parliament to raise the age of criminal prosecution further. But the safe way to do so is after proper review, scrutiny and development of detailed proposals and their implications in this regard. Finally, I acknowledge that the UN Committee will issue its general comment number 24 imminently and is likely to recommend that states set a minimum age of criminal responsibility of at least 14. But as per its draft comment, it may also encourage states to ensure that there are no exceptions to its minimum age and to provide legal safeguards for equitable treatment of children above and below the minimum age. With this bill, unlike in other countries, we are absolutely fulfilling these latter points. It's also worth noting that many of the other actions that the UN Committee calls for on youth justice, Scotland is already doing and indeed going beyond. Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way again. Does she recognise that the, in 2012, in Do the Right Thing, her predecessor Aileen Campbell committed to this increase in the lifetime of the last Parliament, yet failed to do that? How confident can we be in any claims this Government makes about taking this agenda further? Minister. Well, I've brought forward a review and I've advised an advisory group. The review will report within three years to this Parliament. I am very confident that we are doing the right thing for Scotland today and in future we will continue to do the right thing for Scotland. We are a leading nation on youth justice. We should be proud of that and what it is achieving for our young people. And we have confirmed that we will incorporate the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child into law in the lifetime of this Parliament. At the same time, my amendment 145 allows for consideration of the future age of criminal responsibility as well as review of the operation of the Act generally. I propose a review period of three years from the commencement of Section 1 of the Bill. That will provide a sufficient period of time to allow proper consideration of the impacts of the current change and the new measures we hope to introduce through this Bill, which will be debated later today. I've also announced the new advisory group, which will be established and it will take a play a key role in taking forward this review should members agree to that today. My amendment also requires that a report of the review findings be laid before the Scottish Parliament so that it can play its rightful role in determining the way ahead alongside government. Amendment 155 links with this overall review and more widely to the provisions in this bill. It invests Scottish ministers with the statutory authority to require certain public bodies which hold information about the exercise of functions under part four of the bill to provide information which is considered to be appropriate to the review and the monitoring of how the functions in part four of the bill are being used. I can assure the Chamber that Scottish Ministers only intend to use this power to gather anonymised statistical data showing, for example, the number of applications for a child interview order, the number granted and the types of behaviour that they related to. There will be no requirement to disclose the sensitive personal data of any children in any specific cases. Presiding Officer, this bill is fundamentally about enhancing children's rights but the Scottish Government also has positive obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights to maintain an effective system for the investigation of crime and the rights of victims. We cannot put children, communities and victims at risk by rushing into changes without being certain that the responsible agencies are ready to do so effectively and safely. So we need to get the balance right. Raising the age beyond 12 in this bill would not achieve that. The responsible approach is to raise the age to 12 now 
and allow a statutory review to be undertaken to consider the future age of criminal responsibility. I have made clear my commitment to making progressive changes which benefit Scotland's children and to continue the evidence and expert-led approach which has been so successful at generating consensus to date. This bill represents a radical, bold and ambitious reform which will create a significant cultural shift. The pace at which we are moving needs to command public confidence. I believe by removing all primary school aged children in Scotland from criminal responsibility, we have got the balance right. I therefore urge members to resist all of Mr Cole Hamilton's amendments, to support raising the age to 12 and to vo vote for my amendments 145 and 155. Thank you. I have a number of members who wish to contribute in this group. Uh, I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Mark Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak against Amendment 1 proposed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Um, in the Stage 1 debate, I stated strongly that I favoured the age of criminal responsibility to be raised to 14 as a minimum. My view on that has not changed. I still do. However, I will be voting against Amendment 1 because, as we've heard, Amendment 145 inserts um, that today's legislation will be reviewed with a view to raising it in future through an, the introduction of an expert advisory group, uh, review group, and that's given me uh, reassurance. I, I hope that future is not far away, um, but it is important to have the confidence of the public and professionals and agencies who will be required to manage this change, such as the children's hearing system and the police. And I certainly have a greater understanding of what's involved in that now. Uh, Alex Cole Hamilton's amendment would inevitably have the effect of criminalising children for longer, and I'm certain that's not what he wants. So as I said, Amendment 145 uh, inserts a statutory requirement for ministers to carry out a review of the Act itself and of the age, and I think this is a good amendment. Presiding officer, I believe a child or young person who ends up in the criminal justice system is a child who's been failed by adults who should have applied early intervention to stop the child getting into trouble. In my view, the importance of ACEs cannot be overstated. Children should not be labelled as offenders as the harm caused by doing this is everlasting and will impact greatly on their future. So I think this bill is a step in the right direction, but in my view, it's only the start of the journey and I hope it's a quick one. Thank you. I call Mark Macdonald to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by saying that I'm grateful to Alex Cole Hamilton for the conversations that he's had with me in advance of tabling these amendments. Uh, also, we join him in paying tribute to Alison McInnes, who uh, was somebody I enjoyed working with when she represented the northeast of Scotland. But I, I believe, Presiding Officer, the debate uh, on this issue has evolved during the process of this legislation, and I believe that at the same time as that debate has evolved, our thinking should do so as well, which is why I have come to the position I have come to of supporting the position that Alec Cole Hamilton has advanced. I believe there's a question around the balance of approach. Uh, we've spoken at length in the debates around this legislation about the question of needs versus deeds, um, the idea that it's important that we understand what lies behind the harmful actions which some children may commit and how best to address those. I believe that taking the approach of raising the age to 14 would help us to ensure that children don't fall into the criminal justice system at an early age and often the cycle of offending behaviour that can result as a consequence of that. When one looks at the uh, picture across Europe, presiding officer, if one takes England and Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland as separate jurisdictions, as one must given the different ages uh, that each operates in terms of criminal responsibility, we find that 10 jurisdictions in Europe have a criminal age of responsibility which is below 14, 12 have an age which is over 14 and 25 have an age which is at 14 in terms of the minimum age of criminal responsibility. I believe that setting the age at 14 would therefore place Scotland in the correct position in relation to our European counterparts. I also listened very carefully to the arguments being made uh, both by the Minister and, and by Rona Mackay and I think it becomes very clear when listening to them that this is not a question about the principle uh, of raising the age to 14. I think the principle is broadly accepted. It's a question about the technical ability to be able to do so. Now, I take the view that we could overcome those technical difficulties. The Minister takes a, a different view in terms of the time that would be required to do that. Um, I recognise 
the mathematics of the situation are that they were not going to go there yet, but I think it's important that we have this debate and this discussion. I also think it's important that we have a very clear understanding and adherence to timescales. Uh, I say at the outset that if uh, Alec Cole Hamilton's amendments are defeated as I expect, knowing the maths of the Chamber, they will be. I will be voting in favour of the Minister's Amendments 145 and 155 because I do believe that the principle, I think, exists and is supported. And therefore, I believe that the pressure can be exerted to ensure that the timescale is stuck to. I'm perhaps slightly more optimistic than Mr Cole Hamilton in that regard. But nonetheless, I will be supporting Mr Cole Hamilton's amendments in relation to 14. He hasn't quite convinced me about 16 yet, um, but I will also support the Minister's amendments should those amendments fall. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And, and as I stand, I, I'd like to pay tribute in many ways to the arguments that Alex Cole Hamilton uh, makes. He, the, the, the are principled arguments, and one in, in, in many ways which I agree with. However, there is an issue in terms of uh, the timing that we are, are facing, the proposition that's been brought to Parliament before this point. I think it's unfortunate. Um, that uh, the recommendations from the United Nations has changed through the, the passage of this bill, because I do believe in the importance of international institutions and the international rule of law. However, the proposition that has gone through Parliament is 12 and not 14, and I think there are serious practical considerations. And indeed, I think even the proposition as it stands, as we will uh, look at later on through the amendments and the debate, I think there are causes for concern, issues that we need to get right, in both in terms of the practicalities of providing places of safety and also the exercise of these powers, both by the police and in other elements of um, uh, the criminal, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, both uh, public services and indeed the criminal justice system. So for those reasons, I do not believe that we can support uh, uh, the, the amendments in Alex Cole Hamilton's name. Uh, I think we should support uh, raising the age uh, to 12 uh, rather than to 14, but we must also uh, uh, support uh, the amendments in the, in the minister's name, uh, putting in place a review which will examine the, exactly the, the, the issues and indeed the reasons and principles that Alex Cole Hamilton so uh, eloquently laid out, because it is important that we review this, and it is important that we do everything we can to, to do our part to uphold international standards, but I do not believe now is the time and we must support uh, the, 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 uh, the raising to 12, but, but, but not to, to 14 this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. We on these benches believe that 12 strikes the right balance. Uh, there is nothing that's been said in today's debate uh, or indeed in the further evidence uh, that was taken at committee uh, that has convinced us that that changes. We are, however, uh, content to support uh, the government's amendments for review because it is important uh, when making this type of change uh, that affects a number of other aspects of our legal system that we're sure that it's working um, and uh, we are open uh, to, 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 to hear the evidence uh, brought forward at that point from those uh, who know our criminal justice system best. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Finney to be followed by Fulton McGregor. John Finney. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. The, the Scottish Government's direction of travel is very welcome, but they quite simply haven't gone far enough, and we'll be supporting uh, Mr Cole Hamilton's amendments. And, you know, I, I know many people view this as a, a huge step, and uh, I accept that that's the case, and a, a significant culture change. And, of course, people will rightly identify practical situations that need to, to, to be dealt with. But, you know, with a, a direction of travel given by, by government, uh, and the necessary wall. I, I believe that uh, we could go further. Now, I, I'm a pragmatist, and I, I think we, we know the arithmetic of this. Um, but the, the minister also talked about taking um, uh, the lead from experts, and I would simply point to what the UN has said. I accept the children's hearing, and nothing should infer criticism of the children's hearing system, which we should rightly be proud of. But also the children's commissioner, someone charged with the obligation of informing the Scottish government uh, 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 about... Um, so, uh, our position in relation to these matters. Um, the incorporation, of course, is very positive. Um, I have to say that the Minister's um, um, Amendment 145 is, is a poor second. Um, uh, review in three years should mean that there should be no, no further delay beyond that. So, on the understanding that it's very unlikely that we're going to uh, be def defeated on the... Um, more progressive approach than certainly Greens will be supporting uh, the Ministers 145 and 155. Thank you. And Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to um, thank Alec Cole Hamilton for bringing this uh, amendment to the Chamber, but I do want to comment on uh, the tone 
uh, of his uh, opening speech when he referred to SNP obstruction, when actually I would say as a member of the, the committee that looked at it as well, there was actually quite a lot of constructive debate on the issue. And not just now, I want to make, I want to make some progress and then I'll perhaps let you back in. But 14 uh, is for myself, as, as my colleague Rona Mackay and many others have said, is, it, is the minimum place to get to. But I've been convinced by the argument by the minister made at committee to, to move more gradually to this place and allow our services and our ju justice system to adopt. And I'd ask Alex Cole Hamilton not to mix up the debate that we've had with people coming to their, their views on this as being obstructive. And indeed, I would actually go as far to say that he has refused at every point to accept that his own amendments may just cause a delay to the rollout, um, you know, to protect 12 year olds. So, yes, I will. Okay. Alex Cole Hamilton. On two occasions, presiding officer, I've been accused of delaying the implementation of an ACR of 12, but my Sunrise Amendment actually sees 12 achieved at royal assent and then moving forward to 14 or 16 on the advice of the committee. As for obstruction, the, uh, the previous Children's Minister committed to the United Nations in 2012 to achieve an ACR of 12 in the last Parliament. Alison McInnes, the Liberal Democrat MSP, offered this government two separate occasions on which to make that happen, and they were both rebuffed. That is obstruction. Fulton McGregor. I thank Alec Cole Hamilton for um, making that intervention. I, I disagree with what he's saying because he's, well, 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 he's been making a point consistently through committee that, uh, that, that, that uh, this won't obstruct the rollout and the minister and the government have come back saying that it will. So, so what the point I was trying to make in, in the earlier remarks was you're not even willing to accept that. So that, that, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. But the, uh, you know, the minister has brought forward an amendment which I would encourage everybody to support. I think it's a good amendment, I think it's a sensible amendment. It brings it back in three years, and perhaps we can have that, de that debate again at that point. I've said what, where my stance is on the issue, and I think this is a sensible amendment at this time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and I call on Alex Crowell Hamilton to uh, conclude or to wind up in this group, and also to press or withdraw the amendment. I may very well wind up, presiding officer. Um, Presiding officer, put simply, without increasing the age of criminal responsibility to 14 or still higher now, this bill not, does not just set the face of this government and this parliament against the rights of children. It fatally undermines any claim that we have as a human rights leader on the world stage. To aim at the international minimum and miss in this way will set us on a par with the four most socially conservative countries in all of Europe. It makes a mockery of our aspirations towards human rights leadership internationally. Now, I welcomed, along with everyone else, the report of Sir Alan Miller and the First Minister's advisory group on human rights leadership. But we have wasted the time of a good man and those around him. But simply, we decry human rights abuses in countries like China and Russia. But both of these have ages of criminal responsibility higher still than we will achieve in the passage of this bill today. Again, presiding officer, you cannot lead the world on human rights from the back of the pack. Now, last week, I should have attended a cross-party group to celebrate the achievements of the Year of Young People, but I could not stomach it. I could not bear to listen to the minister speaking of her love and the love of her government for the children and young people of this country and their achievements. With this bill, we are saying to the young people in Scotland, this country will govern you with love until you break the law, at which point that love ends. So I will remind the minister and her government of this day and this craven piece of legislation every time it claims to stand up for children or for human rights. Every sugar-coated motion it seeks to bring to this chamber and every saccharine policy announcement it uses to promote the image of its commitment to the rights and interests of Scotland's children. I will remind it and anyone who will listen of this day. If my amendments fall, I will only vote for this bill because the current ACR over which the SNP had presided this past decade is frankly medieval. Unamended presiding officer, this bill is an embarrassment. The government have no cause to speak of it with pride and I cannot celebrate its passing tonight. I wish to press my amendment. Thank you very much. And just before we come to the vote on Amendment 1, uh, just to explain, uh, Amendment 1 is a direct alternative to Amendment 2. Uh, and just to explain, because there are a couple of direct alternatives today, um, a decision will be taken on both amendments in the order in which they appear in the marshalled list. If both the first and the second amendment were to be agreed to, then the second amendment succeeds the former and the first amendment would cease to have effect. So on that note, the question is that amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. 
were not agreed, and this is the first division of the day, so there will be a five-minute suspension while I call members to the chamber. A five-minute suspension.
Thank you, uh, colleagues. We are back in session and we move to a vote. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now and this will be a 30-second division. The result of the vote on amendment number one in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 11, no, 108. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment two in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number two in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 10, no, 110. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment three in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated. Alex Cole Hamilton, move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number three in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 11, no, 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment four in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call amendment five in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Move or not moved? Not moved. That is not moved. I call amendment six in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Move or not moved? Not moved. That is not moved. And Mr. Clarendon, I was going to call the amendments up to Amendment 15. And uh, I'd like to press uh, Amendments 9, 10, I'll, 11 and 12. In that case, it will be easy. I'll, I'll go through one more at this stage. That's fine. After that, you... I call Amendment 7 in the name of Alice Cole Hamilton, already debated. Alice Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 8, Alice Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 9 in the name of Alice Cole Hamilton. Alice Cole Hamilton move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 9 in the name of Alex Crowell Hamilton is yes, 11, no, 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of Alex Crowell Hamilton. Alex Crowell Hamilton, move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 10 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 10, no, 111. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Already debated. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 12. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 13. In the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I'm, is... I'm not planning to move any of these now, presiding officer. Okay. We're just coming to the end of this section, but I'll, okay. I'll group them in the section after this. That is not moved. The question, sorry, I call Amendment 15 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Alex Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. So we're going to move on now to Group 2, which is on the disclosure of information pre-12 convictions. And could I call Amendment, Amendment 98 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 99, 100, 102, 103 and 147, and the Minister to move Amendment 98 and to speak to all amendments in this group? Presiding officer, a number of the amendments in this group clarify existing provisions or make minor or consequential changes. Amendment 98 is needed to reflect a change being made to the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 by the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill, which is currently before Parliament. Amendment 101 seeks to leave no doubt in relation to what the word purpose refers to in subsection 4E4A. Amendment 103 seeks to make clear that the meaning of other relevant information in the Police Act 1997 and the PVG Act can include information about relevant behaviour as defined in this bill. It is designed to aid understanding and implementation of the bill's provisions. Amendment 99 seeks to bring an investigative interview by agreement under section 31A2 of the bill within the scope of the relevant behaviour as Minister, just one second. Um, if members would just please keep the conversation down to a minimum. Um, the Minister is quite softly spoken. I'd like to hear what she has to say. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to focus on Amendment 102, which follows on from amendments to made to Part 2 of the Bill at Stage 2. Those amendments inserted measures to provide certain protections to prevent a person from having to disclose information relating to pre-12 behaviour in situations such as job applications or judicial proceedings. They also provided for those protections not to apply in cases where disclosure of information about pre-12 behaviour in an enhanced in disclosure certificate or PVG record scheme has been approved by the independent reviewer. Information about relevant behaviour is not, however, only used or disclosed by Disclosure Scotland or by the individuals to whom it relates. There are a variety of proceedings in which such information may need to be considered and used, such as proceedings under the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 or proceedings relating to the adoption of children. Subsections 1 and 2 of this amendment therefore make provision to allow the use of information about pre-12 behaviour in certain proceedings like this. A regulation making power here allows Scottish ministers to amend this list to set out further modifications and exceptions in relation to disclosure of information about relevant behaviour in certain proceedings. 
Amendment 147 provides for re such regulations to be subject to the affirmative procedure so that members will be given a, the appropriate opportunity to scrutinise any changes made under these powers. Amendment 100 is consequential on Amendment 102 and is technical in nature. Part 2 highlights fully the need to get the balance right with this legislation, to raise the age of criminal responsibility and allow children and adults to move on from behaviour and circumstances from before they were 12, but also to ensure that relevant information can be shared proportionately to help keep people, children and vulnerable adults and communities safe. I move Amendment 98. Uh, thank you very much. And members may have noted that we have passed the agreed time limit for the debate on this group to finish. I exercise my power under Rule 9.8.4a to allow the debate on this group to continue beyond the limit. Now, no other member wishes to uh, speak in this group. I take it the Minister has no other comments to make to wind up. Um, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 98 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call amendments 16 to 25, all in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, all previously debated. Could I invite Mr Cole Hamilton to indicate whether he wishes to move or not move? Not move. They are not moved. I call amendments 99 to 102, all in the name of the Minister, and all previously debated. Could I invite the Minister to move the amendments on block? Move. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question be put on these amendments on block? Oh, yes, we had. Okay, well. Move these ones individually in that case. In that case, uh, I call Amendment 99 in the name of the Minister. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 100 in the name of the Minister. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 101 in the name of the Minister. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 102 in the name of the Minister. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now. Because this is a new group, this is a one-minute division. The result of the vote on amendment number 102 in the name of Marie Todd is yes, 90, no, 32. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendments 26 and 27 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. The member to move or not move? Not moved. They are not moved. I call amendment 103 in the name of the minister, already debated. The minister to move formally? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendments 28 to 39 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, the member to indicate whether he wishes to move or not move. Uh, not moved. They are not moved. And we turn now to Group 3, Places of Safety, Use of Police Stations and Police Cells within Police Stations. I call Amendment 148 in the name of Daniel Johnson, Grouped with the amendments as shown in the groupings, Daniel Johnson to move Amendment 148 and to speak to all the amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This bill uh, is important in terms of lifting children out of the scope of the criminal law, and that is right and proper. But as we do so, we must consider carefully the way in which the powers and indeed the, the responsibilities that this bill sets out will be exercised in particular by the police, who in many cases will be uh, at the very forefront of ensuring that this bill is carried out in the way in which this parliament intends. 
And in particular, uh, we need to give great consideration to that role that we ask our police to, to carry out as guardians in our community, protecting um, uh, uh, ordinary citizens going about their daily lives, which is why the provisions around places of safety are so important, but they are also very uh, sensitive indeed, which is what the amendments in, in this section uh, seek to clarify and, and uh, provide greater detail on. As we do so, though, it is important to note that the powers set out in this bill do not stand alone. There are existing welfare powers, as indeed there are also existing stipulations regarding places of safety in the 2016 Criminal Justice Act. But we must get the balance right, and there is a balance to be struck, in particular about what constitutes a place of safety. Because what practical difference is there if a, a place of safety, in terms of the experience of the child, looks and feels no different to if that individual had been arrested uh, within the scope of the criminal law. So therefore, making sure that we have clarity about what constitutes a place of safety, making sure that a police station is only used in the very last resorts, and also ensuring uh, that that place of safety power is uh, used correctly and in the right circumstances is, is particularly important. But the second part, I think, believe that requires clarification are ensuring that police have clarity around the implementation of this because the, 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 the criterion set out in section 23 of this bill rightly sets a very high bar to the use of this power in terms of taking a child to a place of safety. But there is a concern that there is potentially a gap between that threshold of significant harm being caused to another individual and the welfare powers that already exist. And in particular, if we consider the circumstances of an 11-year-old graffitiing a wall or keying a car, committing criminal damage, in those circumstances, it's hard to construe that that child is causing significant harm to another individual. Uh, nor, if they are not, uh, uh, not familiar to the police, it, could you consider that they, uh, there would be uh, justifiable welfare concerns on what grounds would the police therefore be acting if that child has been lifted out of the scope of the criminal law? This gap requires clarification. And at this point, can I just thank uh, the Scottish Police Federation and also the Association of Sco uh, Scottish Police Superintendents, but also the government for the very extensive discussions that have been happening in the last week. Those discussions have been important. They've been quite pressurized, if I might add, but they've been hugely important. So I would thank all three of those uh, uh, groups for that. But and to go through my amendments in some detail, regarding the place of safety, uh, Amendment 149 states that a child can only be kept in a police station if the child is behaving in a violent manner, and that also that that can only be used uh, when uh, a constable at the rank of inspector above considers it to be so. I think this provides, I think, both uh, an important threshold and criteria for the police, but also, I think, in terms of safeguarding the individual police constable ensuring that the decision is, uh, making is made at the correct level. Um, again, Amendment 150 in, ensures that uh, further detail is provided in terms of that definition of a, a place of safety. Perhaps most importantly, Amendment 151, I think there was significant concern voiced about ensuring that there was an availability of alternative places of safety for the police, that uh, while the, the, the bill uh, as sets out makes a number of provisions in terms of uh, presumption against use of police station, that they may find themselves uh, uh, unavoidably using police stations, but that the lack of clarity uh, may uh, provide them with significant challenges in terms of that decision making. What Amendment 151 does is require the government to compile and maintain a list of acceptable places of safety. And I think it's important that the, the, there is no assumption that this list is exhaustive but simply that this would uh, uh, require a, a uh, maintenance of a list that could be used and referred to by the police so that they can with confidence uh, 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 refer to that list and use those places of safety as compiled uh, by the government. But I do also need to turn to that second point around the, the practical issues in terms of the exercise of the, the place of safety. And as I've said, it sets rightly a, hit a high bar, but we do, I think, require further clarification about how that high bar uh, is applied and how it is to be used by individual police officers. And therefore, uh, Amendments 109A and 109B are amendments to a government amendment 
uh, requiring specifically for the government to set out what constitutes significant harm and how that should be applied, requiring the government to set that out in statutory guidance so police officers can have the clarity that they require in terms of exercising those rights and indeed responsibilities. Lastly, Amendment 148 was an attempt to set out an alternative approach, provide greater clarity and further detail through statutory guidance, <clears throat> which was called for by the police. However, I do also recognise the issues that this amendment would have uh, created in terms of setting a criteria, a legal criteria, but one which would have been codified in statutory guidance. And that, it, I do accept, is a flaw, which is why we'll not be pressing that particular amendment. So these amendments do go in some ways, uh, I feel, to providing clarity and certainty in terms of the use of the places of safety. However, I do not believe that they address fully the potential gap between the welfare powers and the new power in terms of uh, place of safety. So I would call on the government to clarify what powers they believe police officers will have to simply take a child home to their parents when that child is to use sort of vernacular language up to no good and to be able to do so without fear of further repercussion because that is the common sense approach to policing. The common sense thought that if a, a police officer sees a child doing something that they shouldn't, that they can simply put their hand on their shoulder and take them back to their parents or guardians. So I'd ask the government to point where in statute, where in common law and where in case law, they believe the police will have powers to do the common sense thing of returning a child to its home where there are no welfare considerations and where they are not causing or likely to cause significant harm to an individual. And I would call on the government to also explain why it has not considered remitting uh, this to stage two, because I believe this is an important point that did require further scrutiny. And, and I, I, I think it's with regret that we've had so little time to consider this very important point in this bill. And I'll close that point, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And I call on Alex Cole Hamilton to speak to Amendment 90 and the other amendments. Oh, Minister, uh, I beg your pardon, Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, uh, I'm going to call the Minister before in the order here. Could I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 149A and the other amendments in the group? And then I'll call the member. Thank you, presiding officer. Part four of the bill seeks to provide powers to allow investigation of an incident of significant harm involving a primary school aged child. They're intended for use only in the most serious circumstances and reflect the recommendations of the advisory group, whose members included Police Scotland, Social Work and Children's Charities. Those recommendations were consulted on extensively with conclusions published in 2016. <coughs> These made clear that national guidance on child protection should be revised to include guidance for managing the welfare of and risks posed by children's harmful behaviour. That review is now underway, so it reflects the terms of this bill. No examples were forthcoming in the consultation or indeed since then, highlighting concerns that children's behaviour would not be covered under existing criteria, such as causing harm to others or being with, out with parental control. Powers already exist in statute and common law to allow police officers, beyond the scope of what is in this bill, to address the need to take a child to a place of safety where an officer considers there are wider child welfare protection considerations. The range of police powers here relating to the most harmful incidents also doesn't impact on their general duties, for example, to prevent crime and to maintain order. Police officers can still intervene in incidents involving lower level harmful behaviour, engaging with the child in an age appropriate way. They just cannot do so with reference to criminal justice powers, such as of arrest or holding in custody. At present, powers under common law allow officers to take a child home with their consent. This will continue. Child protection powers also enable the police to take a child to a place of safety, even where that consent is not forthcoming. Presiding officer, my amendment 157 seeks to make absolutely clear that all of these powers will continue. The bill, however, Marks a, will mark a fundamental change in entirely removing under 12s from traditional criminal justice processes and successful implementation of its measures will require the confidence of professionals and delivery partners, including Police Scotland. 
My Amendment 109 therefore provides for statutory guidance on Section 23. Its broad scope at subsection 1A allows a wide range of matters to be covered. However, I agree that it would be useful to specify in this guidance what is meant by significant harm and the circumstances in which a child may be taken to a place of safety. Accordingly, I support Daniel Johnson's amendments 109A and 109B. I'm absolutely committed to involving the expertise of Police Scotland and their staff associations and other partner agencies in developing that guidance. I would expect that process to consider whether the existing powers I have outlined are sufficient. If any gaps are identified, we will consider how best to address those, including through additional appropriate primary legislation. This will allow for careful planning ahead of implementation, with all the delivery issues worked through and the appropriate guidance, training and systems put in place before commencement. I hope this assures Daniel Johnson and others that he would agree now there is no need to press Amendment 148. Nor would it be desirable to effectively remove the scope of the place of safety power from the face of the bill into guidance. Amendment 148 could in inadvertently result in future expansion or limitation of the scope of the power without reference to Parliament. And I hope that we might all agree that that would be undesirable. There are also legitimate rights concerns. Keeping a child in a place of safety is a deprivation of their liberty, which needs a clear legal basis to comply with our human rights obligations under ECHR. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child is also clear that there must be legal safeguards in place to ensure the treatment of children below the age of responsibility is as fair and just as that of children at or above it. I committed at stage two to consider what more could be done to restrict the use of police, police cells as places of safety. My amendment 104 effectively creates a presumption against the use of police cells. Where their use can't be avoided, it must be authorised by an inspector or above. As Cole Hamilton. Well, for giving way, I hear what the Minister says about uh, using cells as a tool of last resort, but what does she say to the briefing provided to members by Police Scotland in which Police Scotland state that they have maintained that our, in their words, our estate is never a suitable location for a child who is subject to place of safety provisions. Minister. I think that everybody who has been involved in this passage of this bill is agreed that that would not be the ideal location, but there are circumstances where they could imagine it being the only suitable location. Amendment 105 clarifies that the requirement to transfer a child to a place of safety other than a police station as soon as reasonably practicable applies regardless of whether a cell has been used. I welcome paragraph B of Amendment 149 which applies a similar safeguard to 104 requiring such authorisation for the use of a police station. However, I have lodged an amendment to remove paragraph A of 149. I appreciate what Daniel Johnson is trying to achieve here but it turns the focus back onto a child's behaviour rather than their needs. Nor would it allow for a police station to be used where it is the only practical option in a remote rural area. I would hope that Mr Johnson would recognise this and accept my amendment 149A. For similar reasons, I hope Alec Cole Hamilton will not now press amendments 90 to 96. We are all broadly trying to achieve the same effect to strictly limit the use of police stations and cells, but the effects of 93 to 95 would be highly impractical, requiring application to a sheriff will lengthen the process, potentially leaving a distressed child at greater risk of trauma. I recognise that this is the very opposite of what Mr Cole Hamilton intends, so I hope he will not press his amendments. I already accepted Alec Cole Hamilton's amendment at stage two to restate in law what facilities can be used as places of safety. Amendment 106 to 108 simply tidy up that section and in particular remove the language of availability of a place of safety so that the focus can rightly be on suitability. As my amendments also achieve broadly a similar effect of Daniel Johnson's Amendment 150, I do not think it's needed. And while a national list of places of safety is not strictly necessary, it will allow us to ensure that there is consistent practice across the country, so I will support Daniel Johnson's Amendment 151. Finally, 
At stage two, I was keen to acknowledge that the use of the place of safety powers needs to be monitored and evaluated. So I welcome Ruth Maguire's amendments 152, 153 and 156. Presiding officer, we need to get the balance right when the age of criminal responsibility is raised. Police Scotland are committed to keeping children and young people safe. They and other partners appreciate that engagement with children in their early years will influence their perspective on policing for the rest of their lives. Research supports that. Part four of the bill does not interfere with or impede the thoughtful and child-centered policing that goes on currently every day in communities across Scotland. Implementation will be carefully planned to provide the right guidance to help the police keep children safe. I'm committed to meaningfully raising the age of criminal responsibility, but we must also continue to respond to the needs of victims and the wider community. With a clear test at section 23.2 and provision for statutory guidance to support operational practice, as well as a strong set of rules around the use of police stations and police cells as places of safety and reporting and monitoring mechanisms on their use, I believe we now have the right balance on these sections. I move my amendments and I urge members to support them. I encourage members to support Ruth Maguire's amendments 152, 153 and 156. I support Daniel Johnson's amendments 109A, 109B, 149 if amendment 1049A is also agreed and 151. I hope Daniel Johnson will now withdraw amendment 148. If it is pressed, I cannot support it and nor will I support 150 or 90 to 96. Thank you very much. Could I call Alice Cole Hamilton to speak to Amendment 90 and the other amendment in the group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendments 90 and the other group amendments in this group in my name. Um, these amendments stem as a reaction to very powerful testimony from an extraordinary individual that committee members heard at Stage 1 evidence. Lindsay Hanvidge was 13 years old in 2007. On the night that she was taken into care, she arrived home to find uh, a lot of police officers congregating outside her house, and she was instructed of the reality that she was about to be taken into care. She was desperately concerned. She didn't know what was wrong with her mum. She wanted to find out, and she kicked off as uh, it was a, a, a normal reaction to an abnormal set of events. In, that, uh, in the altercation that happened, she assaulted a police officer, was cuffed outside her house, taken to the police station, about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, separated from her family, all of her family, and spent the night in the cells without communication until 7 o'clock the next morning. The point is, she was put there under place of safety provisions. The untold harm that she was given and occurred to her as a result of that experience dem is demonstrable of the fact that police cells are never places of safety as far as children are, are concerned. But simply presiding officer, in the, one, in the middle of one adverse childhood experience, this state stopped and handed her another. And that is an unconscionable reaction. Everybody on the committee recognized the humanity of, of Lindsay's story and, and had a desire to do something about it. It is from where my amendments around the prohibition of cell use stem. I remind members of the intervention I've just made on the minister. The police Scotland don't want to ever have to use cells in terms of police of safety provision. I will. Oliver Mundell. Member for uh, giving way. I understand that police Scotland don't want to use cells. I don't want to see uh, police cells used for children uh, either. Uh, but does the member recognise that in some circumstances, for example, in my constituency, which is largely rural, it might be preferable uh, on occasion for young people to spend a short period of time in a police cell rather than be transported a long distance in the back of a police van. Yeah. I think we all have to throw our cap over the wall on this. That hypothetical has been used several times. I recognise that remote and island communities may only have a police station, may only have a police cell as the de minimis position for the place of safety provision. But if that police cell already had a sex offender in it, you would not expect to use that cell as a, a place of safety. We need to box clever on this. We need to widen our ambition. And if it costs money, then let's spend that money. Because, presiding officer, Article 37 in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child states that every child deprived of liberty shall be treated in a manner which takes account of the needs of the persons of his or her age. Nothing about spending a night in a cell without contact with family, without basic comforts that children require for their sustain, for sustained thriving 
uh, is met by holding them in a cell. And as such, we are in contravention of Article 37 on the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. They should also, it also states we should never hold children where adults are held. And so you cannot guarantee that the police stations on a Friday or Saturday night, when these provisions are most likely to be used, are anywhere like a safe place to take a child based on what else might be happening in that police station. I recognise that, once again, the, the mathematics of the parliamentary arithmetic are not in my favour. That is why amendments like uh, 95 in my, name, in my name make it harder for those cell use to become a tool of last resort, or the default setting, rather. And as such, it must mean that duty constables must seek approval from somebody beyond the station to authorise the cell use as a very, very last resort. The problem is... Lindsay Hanbridge's story suggests that there is no real guidance to Police Scotland at the moment about cell use in place of safety terms. I welcome and will vote for the Minister's amendments to that end. But right now, it's happening on a, on a scale we just don't comprehend or understand. My amendments either will prohibit it entirely or make it very difficult for them to become the default. Because without it, we cannot ensure the safety of our children is guaranteed. Police cells are simply not safe places. And as such, I move my amendment. And Ruth McGuire to speak to Amendment 152 and the other amendments in this group. Presiding officer, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee have had extensive debate throughout stages one and two on place of safety. Um, we've listened to all of the concerns throughout and I welcome the changes made by the Minister and also accepted by her into the Bill to strengthen these provisions. But I'm also um, very clear about the purpose of Part 4 in its entirety. When we raise the age of criminal responsibility, there will still need to be powers for police and other public agencies to act to address the very small number of instances of significant harm that may involve a child under 12. I believe the powers we have in part four are necessary and proportionate, but I also welcome Daniel Johnson's amendments and the ministers to provide further assurance in relation to the police's power to take a child to a place of safety. As convener of the committee, I want to assure everyone in this chamber that every opportunity was given to the police to raise these concerns at stages one and two. I've revisited the evidence provided by Police Scotland and I note that the Scottish Police Federation did not actually provide written evidence at stage one. I welcome Police Scotland's focus in its written evidence on the need for child-centred policing and that the need for powers in part four would primarily be focused on meeting a child's needs. On section 23 specifically, their evidence raised a concern about the very narrow drafting only to allow for response to immediate risk and saying the section does not appear to confer any power to respond to the immediate aftermath of an incident. That's quite different from the issues that Police Scotland have raised publicly immediately before stage 3. But I've also considered what it is they now appear to be asking for, which is to have a much broader, almost unfettered power to remove any child below the age of 12 to a place of safety for any reason through this bill. I simply can't accept this. It would have the effect of raising the age of criminal responsibility, but leaving the police with quite far-reaching powers. Daniel Johnson. I would thank the member for giving way. I don't believe that is what the police are asking for. I think what they are simply asking for is a clarification that they can continue to do the common sense policing, the, the simple hand on the shoulder uh, that they continue to do and having that certainty and they're concerned about that lack of clarity. So I just would wonder if the, that the member might reflect that uh, as she concludes her remarks. Ruth McGuire. Uh, thank Daniel Johnson for that intervention. I will come on to that. Um, so... That it would have the effect of raising the age of criminal responsibility but leaving the police with quite far-reaching powers to remove any child to a place of safety. This um, recent stushy, if you want to call it that, would perhaps also show us that we have some way still to travel to change practice and culture. Now, police and communities in my Cunningham South constituency do an absolutely fantastic job of keeping children safe. They respond in early and effectively to children's needs and issues, while also giving confidence to the wider community. We have to be sure that work can continue in the future. So the arguments in favour of the Minister's Amendment 109 to create statutory guidance become more compelling, as indeed do the arguments in favour of my amendments 152, 153 and 156. These strengthen the Bill's provisions and I hope address the points raised by Daniel Johnson at Stage 2. Not only should the use of Section 23 powers be monitored, but they should also be reported on. My Amendment 152 therefore specifically extends the regulation-making power under Section 24 to include the power 
to impose requirements that information be recorded on why, where and for how long a child under 12 is taken to and kept in a place of safety. The reason why a child under 12 is kept in a police station as the place of safety and the reason why a child under 12 is at any time kept in a cell within a police station. I would suggest that this monitoring is absolutely essential, particularly in the early years of implementation, to ensure that the provisions are not more widely applied than the law allows for, but also to highlight whether or not recently articulated concerns are justified. Amendment 153 requires Scottish ministers to prepare a report in relation to the information recorded in Amendment 152. And so that all this happens timiously, the first report should be laid before the Scottish Parliament as soon as practicable after the first year of Section 23 being in force. Amendment 153 then requires subsequent reports to be laid. Because regulations will specify exactly what information is to be included in the reports, these should be the subject of appropriate parliamentary scrutiny. My Amendment 156 therefore applies the affirmative procedure. I urge all members to support my amendments. Thank you very much. And I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Liam Thank Kerr. you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak in support of Amendment 148 in the name of Daniel Johnson, and I will press it if he is not minded to. Presiding Officer, it appears possible, at least, that far from being a stooshie, there could be a gap in this bill which would prevent the police from carrying out the duties we expect of them. Or more accurately, the police felt that far from giving them an unfettered ability, the current test as drafted would limit their powers and put them at risk of breaking the law. Now, I understand from the SPF that they are satisfied that Daniel Johnson's amendment covered their worst fears, although only partially closed the gap they had identified. And for that reason, I feel we must back it and Parliament must be given the opportunity to back it. Now, President Officer, since I have the floor, yes. Minister. The in their general duties under Section 20 of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012 to prevent crime, maintain order, protect life and property. And as such, they can intervene in incidents of low-level harmful behaviour, engaging with the child in an age-appropriate way to prevent or to mitigate harm. Firstly, they can talk to them. Where there would be grounds to search them if they were over the age of criminal responsibility, they could search them. That's section 25 of the ACR bill. And if appropriate, confiscate what they find. Where the police consider there's a risk to the child, they can take the child to the place of safety under section 56 of the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011. With the child's consent, they can use their powers under common law to return them home. They can also share information about the incident with parents and social workers. I hope you will consider this information before pressing 148. Liam Kerr. Uh, I thank the Minister for the intervention. I appreciate the Minister says that, but the SPF says not. And the SPF contacted us all uh, rather late on the afternoon of a Sunday, right before the amendments were due in, because it was that urgent and they considered that there was that level of gap there. So I think perhaps the Minister might want to, just to allay concerns later in this process, detail what conversations she has had with the SPF and when, because it does seem this wasn't picked up at stage two. And I'll come back to that point in just two seconds, if I may. Because if that was missed at stage two, which it may well have been, it would appear, then has anything else been missed? And I would be pleased to hear from the Minister when she became aware that this had been missed and how confident she can be, therefore, that there's nothing else lurking. And whether, as Daniel Johnson quite rightly suggests, she considers it would be prudent to remit this bill to the committee to take further evidence to ensure that absolutely everything has been covered off and we don't inadvertently go forward into a situation where there is a gap. So uh, I will be supporting Amendment 148 in Daniel Johnson's name and intend to give Parliament the opportunity to agree. For completeness, we won't support Amendment 151 or any other amendments which restrict the police and fetter their discretion, but we do accept that guidance is necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Mark MacDonald to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I thought um, there was a point that Ruth McGuire made which I think is worth bearing in mind when she spoke about small numbers. And what we're talking about here in terms of the children uh, who will be captured uh, by this legislation who will require to be removed to a place of safety are small numbers. 
And then when you look within that small, those small numbers, the number of children who might find themselves in a position where the only place of safety that is available is a police cell is going to be an even smaller number of children. Therefore, we're talking about exceptionalism within exceptionalism. Now, I do agree that it's important in relation to that that we set out very clear and robust guidance and guidelines. I'm not minded to back the amendments from Alec Hamilton on this because I do think the issue around applying to a sheriff does potentially create difficulties, particularly in situations where a place of safety is required over the course of a weekend and a sheriff may not be readily available in order to respond to any request. However, I do think that there needs to be very robust uh, guidance in place. And I note the Minister doesn't have the summing up in relation to this group of amendments, but perhaps when it comes to the debate, she might be able to offer some clarifications and comfort around how that guidance will be taken forward, how it will be shaped, and what opportunities will be available to scrutinise and analyse that guidance to ensure that it gives the comfort to those of us who have uh, a deep discomfort about the concept of children uh, being placed in police cells for any period of time as part of this uh, may have. I think that, while I will not back uh, Alec Cole Hamilton's amendments on this, I do think he made a very fair point around the issue of adverse childhood experiences and the potential, even although the police cell is being used as a place of safety, the issue that a child who finds themselves in that position is coming from a position where their behaviour is informed by a trauma in their life to then add another potential trauma on top of that because they will not necessarily be able to draw the distinction between being in that police cell as a place of safety or as a place of punishment, uh, the difficulties that that may arise. I also think as we roll out the Barnahus model uh, in Scotland, while I appreciate there will not necessarily be availability of Barnahus in remote and, remote and rural areas, I do think Barnahus could potentially have uh, a role to play in relation to how we deal with those children who find themselves in need of a place of safety for the wider interventions that may be required. So while I will not back uh, those amendments and will support the amendments as outlined uh, by the Minister, I do want to just put on record the need for us to have some clarification and comfort around how that guidance will be taken forward, given the importance of this issue. Thank you. And uh, before we take the next amendment, uh, the next speaker, sorry, as we are nearing the agreed time limit, I'm prepared to exercise my power again under Rule 9.8.4a to allow the debate in this group to continue beyond the limit to, in order to avoid the debate being unreasonably curtailed. And I call John Finney to be followed by Fulton McGregor. John Finney. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, President Officer. Reference has been made to the late intervention of my former colleagues, the Scottish Police Federation, and the concerns they brought in at the 11th hour. Now, uh, the, the Minister, if I, I noted the Minister correctly, talked about this in part being a, a debate out behaviour versus needs. Well, the needs of the child should be at the forefront and of all our considerations in relation to this. And, and I don't believe that there is an issue in the most serious instances. I, I think uh, where I... Uh, and, and the Minister has outlined a range of, of measures that are in place, the, the common law duty put into the Police and Fire Reform Act about preventing crime disorder, child protection at the, the core of this. So I'm, I'm surprised at some of the representations that have been made to me, indeed, colleagues, uh, about this. The idea that some child in possession of an aerosol isn't in need of some form of intervention I find quite peculiar, to be perfectly honest. Um, but um, I think, too, that we need to be very wary of some unintended consequences and never say never. Reference has been made to um, uh, the, the, the use of police stations, and I think it's, it's widely accepted that that would be absolutely minimal. It might be absolutely vital in the, the, uh, the region that I represent. So I think we need some caution around that. Um, there's, there's a range of amendments here. I'm, I'm not going to go through them all. I, I certainly am... Um, I thought uh, I would align myself with a lot of Daniel Johnson's remarks about uh, where we are here, and I think he's entirely right not to, to, to press this. We'll be supporting 149A, the Minister's, um, and, um, and, and Mr Johnson's, also 151 and 152, um, but, but not Mr, Mr Cole Hamilton's. Well-meaning, though, I'm absolutely sure there is. I, I have to tell you, from, from years of experience, it's much easier dealing with a very aggressive large male than it is to deal with uh, um, young children for police officers. They always find it a challenge. Some of the examples given, I, I find, again, very peculiar, because what we're doing is we're moving the threshold up. And uh, I think we need to be wary about the powers that are being used there. I'm not aware that prior to this uh, piece of legislation being brought forward that anyone said there was a deficiency of power for police officers to deal with children under aid. So I think we're just moving a threshold up a bit. Not far enough for us, but it's on its way. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Fulton McGregor. <clears throat> uh, thanks, President Officer. Um, I just want to speak uh, very briefly on Daniel Johnson's 
Amendment uh, 140, and, and just to speak um, against it, I'd, I'd, I heard the, the, the various debates in the chamber there, and a uh, very good intervention um, from John Finney supporting it, but I, I do kind of feel that, the, uh, that it will lower the threshold. Um, and there was, as, as others have commented, there was a lot of discussion on this during the, the, the committee sessions, and I think that everybody uh, was agreed that you know, nobody wanted to, to see a child in a police cell, if at all possible, and we know that the police and social work very, work very hard against that. So I, I, do, I, I will be voting against this amendment if it's pressed, because I do think that <coughs> it will lower the threshold. Um, and Mark MacDonald, in, in his intervention, spoke about the, the, the Barnhouse model. As a member of the Justice Committee, I know that the Scottish Government are looking at, uh, at this after the Justice Committee's um, trip to Barnhouse, and, and there will be more information brought forward to that. I think it will be discussed uh, in Thursday stage three. So um, just to speak against 148, and also Alex Cole Hamilton's uh, amendments as well at 90. Thank you very much. And uh, no other member wishes to speak. Daniel Johnson to wind up in this group and then to press or withdraw. <coughs> uh, officer, I'll, I'll be brief because I think the, the arguments have been uh, well set out. I, I mean, I think in, in essence, the, the, I, I welcome the fact that the government are going to set, uh, uh, support the, the bulk of my amendments. As I already said, I will not be pressing 148. But the, the crux of the key argument here, which is whether or not a, a, a gap exists, and I heard uh, the Minister set out what powers exist under the Police and Fire Reform Act. But the, the, the problem is, 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 is around the, 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 the gap between where there are no welfare considerations and the, the actions being uh, carried out by the child are, are not sufficiently uh, uh, serious so is that they're causing another person harm. And, and what she is relying on, if I understand correctly, is that the child consents at that point. And I think the question is, what if the child does not consent? And indeed, what if the parents do not consent when that child is returned home and that is the question which is at the forefront of the police federation and the association of police superintendents and indeed at the forefront of police scotland's mind and that is the que question which we are, are yet to hear a definitive answer referring to both either statute common law or case law and i, I believe the member would like me to give way Liam Kerr. Uh, thank daniel johnson just uh, the, the the point he's making of course is the right one uh, but the, the point I was making is that the, the police, at least, seem to think that there is an ambiguity there. And that could be ironed out, or at least in part, by this Amendment 148. So isn't that reason enough to at least press it? Daniel Jones. Well, I mean, I thank the member uh, for, for rising in support. The, the, the reality is there are two significant problems. One is it does not fully iron out uh, the, the, the ambiguity as highlighted by all three of those organizations. No, it doesn't completely do that. But I think critically, what it does is set a legal criterion on the exercise of those powers and sets it in statute. And I think that is flawed. And it is a, I think as a result of this amendment being drafted in severe haste, uh, given the, the, the point in the timeline, which is with regret. Uh, with hindsight, and if I had more time, I would have uh, taken greater care to, 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 to draft that in a, in a better way. Unfortunately, I do believe that's very flawed. I don't think that's a good way of making law. I don't believe that legal tests and legal criteria should be at, at the discretion of ministers rather than having the due parliamentary oversight that they would require. But the crux of it is this. I think John Finney set out and summarized it, I think, uh, in, in some ways very well. But un unfortunately, in the end, I, I disagree with him. He believes that the most serious instances would be covered and welfare concerns would be covered, but it's the ones in between, the things which are at a, at a, at a relatively low level of, of misbehavior, where there are no further concerns, but there, there is wrongdoing. You know, and he, he points out the point of the graffiti cam, well, there may be no other uh, objects or implements, and what happens in those situations, and, uh, just, uh, just in a moment, uh, and, and, and uh, most, most in, importantly, um, he, he suggests that all we're doing is raising the threshold. I would contend that an 11-year-old, there is much more likely to be a cohort of individuals where, where there may be concerns where we do need police to be able to exercise these powers. I'll, I'll give you at that point. John Finney. Um, thank you. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. I, I fear he maybe misheard me. What, what I said was in the most serious instances, they invariably take care of themselves. The challenge is about dealing with the other matters. I hope that clarifies Daniel Johnson. I, I, I thank the member for that clarification. I will take myself to my GP for a syringing of my ears. Um, but finally, I think the other point is the interactions between other statutes, whether it's the Police and Fire Reform Act or the Criminal Justice Act 2016 or indeed other acts, which have increasingly codified the common law powers that the police have. I do not believe it's been fully examined whether or not there are unintended consequences 
or uh, uh, inadvertent uh, negative interactions between the legislation that we have in this bill and those bits uh, of legislation which have codified increasingly powers that, that were historically common law powers that the police have to enjoy and indeed we expect them to exercise in, in terms of their duty in protecting our communities. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And uh, am I right in thinking that the member wishes to withdraw his amendment? I do. Now, the member wishes to... Daniel Johnson wishes to withdraw amendment number 148. Does any member object? Object. The Parliament does not consent to amendment 148 being withdrawn. I will therefore put the question. Uh, that amendment 148 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. This is the first division in this group, so there'll be a one-minute division. Members, we cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 148 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes, 34, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 149 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. I call amendment 149A in the name of the minister, minister to move formally. Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 149A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 149A in the name of the Minister is yes, 100, no, 22. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The question is, sorry, yes, Daniel Johnson to press or withdraw 100, amendment 149 as amended. Uh, moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 149 as amended be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 104 in the name of the minister. Minister to move formally. Moved. That's moved. The question is that amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. Amendment 104. The result of the vote on amendment number 104 in the name of the minister is yes, 87, no, 35. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call up amendment 105 in the name of the minister. Minister to move or not? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
We're not agreed. No, the amendment is not agreed to. We will move to a vote. The question is that Amendment 105 we agree to. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 105 in the name of the Minister is yes, 117, no, 5. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call amendment 90 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated? Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 90 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Or not agreed? We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 90 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 27, no, 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 91 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. The member to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 91 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 91 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes 27, no 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 92 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. The amendment to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 92 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes 27, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 93 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated. The member to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 93 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 93 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes 27, no 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. 
Call Amendment 94, in the name of Alice Cole Hamilton, the member to move or not move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Or not agreed? We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 94 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes 27, no 94, there were no abstentions, the amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 157 in the name of the Minister, Minister to move formally. Thank you. The question is that amendment 157 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I call amendment 106 in the name of the Minister, Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 107 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. That is agreed. I call Amendment 108. Minister to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 150 in the name of Daniel Johnston. Already debated. Daniel Johnston to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 150 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 150 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes 27, no 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment, sorry, the, I call amendment 95 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Already debated. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. The question is, sorry, I call amendment 151 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Uh, move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 151 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast the votes now. This is Amendment 151. The result of the vote on amendment number 151 in the name of Daniel Johnson is yes 92, no 30. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 152 in the name of Ruth Maguire. Ruth Maguire to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 152 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Or not agreed? We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 152 in the name of Ruth Maguire is yes, 92, no, 30. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 109 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move. Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I call amendment 109A in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with amendment 148. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. So the question first is that amendment 149A be agreed to. 109. 109A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 109B in the name of Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 109B be agreed to. Are yes. we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Now, Minister, to press or withdraw Amendment 109 as amended. Press. Press. The question is that Amendment 109 as amended be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 153. In the name of Ruth Maguire, Ruth Maguire to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 153 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 40 to 47 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Does the member wish to move or not move these amendments? Not moved. These are not moved. Just to let members know, we're running quite a little uh, behind our schedule, uh, and I'm minded to accept a motion without notice to propose that the next time limit be extended by 20 minutes. Minister, could I call on you to move such a motion? Moved. Thank you. The question is that... Yeah, sorry, another minister. I beg your pardon. Minister, minister Graham Day in this case, Minister of Parliamentary Business. The question is that uh, the next time limit be extended by 20 minutes. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We're going to turn to Group 4 now, appeal processes, and I call Amendment 110 in the name of the Minister, Marie Todd. Grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 110 and to speak to all amendments in the group? Presiding Officer, these amendments relate to the timescales for implementing orders under Part 4 and the handling of appeals relating to them. I want to ensure that the system can work in practice and that children have the opportunity to properly utilise their rights of appeal. In reviewing these provisions, I decided that the timescales for making appeals was too constricted and the periods for implementing orders did not take proper account of the possibility of an appeal. Amendments 110, 116 and 134 allow permission to appeal to be granted only where it's been applied for and not by a sheriff on their own initiative to avoid the possible situation of a person being unaware of permission being granted and then being unable to lodge such an appeal. Amendments 111, 117 and 135 replace the current appeal time limit. This provides only three days within which to both obtain permission from a sheriff and lodge an appeal. The three days are currently not required to be working days. The time limit also does not take account of the possibility that the child might not have been present or represented at the hearing, so might not find out that an order had been made until the police have been able to provide them with a copy. The time limits are altered so that the child will have three working days to seek permission to appeal, beginning with the day after the day on which a copy of the order is provided. Where the police want to appeal a refused order, they'll have three working days beginning with the day after the day of the decision. If permission to appeal is granted, the appeal will have to be lodged within three working days of the decision giving permission. Amendment 142 defines working day for this purpose. Amendments 112, 118 and 136 will apply when there is a, where there is an appeal and the decision of the Sheriff Appeal Court is to uphold an order made by a sheriff or variate. These amendments allow the Appeal Court to set out an implementation period. This will be necessary where there are actions authorised by the order which have not been carried out. These provisions are needed to make sure that the appeal procedure works properly. 
Finally, Amendment 114 provides for a requirement on the police to explain an interview order to the child in an age-appropriate way, bringing the wording into line with related provisions. It's technical, but nonetheless will have an important practical effect for children. In summary then, these amendments seek to provide further clarity on the operation of the new system and ensure that children can make appropriate use of safeguards afforded to them. I encourage members to support them. I move Amendment 110. Thank you. Uh, the motion we just passed is likely to have the effect of moving decision back by 20 minutes. However, I also have to move an internal group time under Rule 9.8.4e to allow this particular group to continue beyond the limit. I call Oliver Mundell. Officer, I, I speak very briefly in support of these amendments. Uh, we support the approach uh, that uh, the Minister has taken and welcome the clarity uh, these bring uh, to the Bill. Thank you for that clarification. Does the Minister wish to add any comments on winding up? The question, therefore, is that Amendment 110 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 111. Minister to move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 111 be agreed to. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Minister to move Amendment 112. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 48 to 51 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. That's all right, yes. Amendments 48 to 51 in the name of uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Member to confirm that he is not moving these amendments. Apologies, presiding officer, not moved. That's not moved. And we're going to turn to group number five the questioning of certain children, child interview rights. All right, we've still got some business to get through here. Group five, questioning of certain children, child interview rights practitioner. Could I call amendment 113 in the name of the minister, grouped with the amendments as shown. Minister to move amendment 113 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Presiding officer, at stage one, a number of respondents raised concerns about the proposal to have an advocacy worker present when a child under 12 is expected to take part in an investigative interview. Since stage one, I have carefully considered these concerns. We also conducted a discrete engagement exercise with key partners on alternatives. Those responses and our analysis have been published and shared with the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. I also alerted the committee to my intention to bring forward amendments at stage three to address these concerns. My intention is not just is, is to not just raise the age of criminal responsibility, but to do so meaningfully. That means lifting children under 12 out of the criminal justice system altogether. But police and other agencies will still have to investigate incidents of significant harm. If a child is to be interviewed, they must have their rights and interests protected. Investigative interviews are non-criminal, which is why Amendment 120 removes a reference to the Criminal Justice Scotland at 2016, brought in at stage two. I see that as a technical, but also a meaningful amendment, which I hope members will support. But such interviews could have serious consequence for the child. The law should therefore provide for legally qualified individuals to provide advice, support and assistance. Further, we must provide a name which makes clear the purpose of the role. Child interview rights practitioner, in my view, achieves that. We need such practitioners to have appropriate skills and knowledge of working sensitively with children and of the children's hearing system. Amendment 132 requires Scottish ministers to set up a register for child interview rights practitioners. Members of the register will be drawn from the children's legal assistance scheme, which means they may continue to represent the child at any subsequent hearing. This recognises and respects the fundamental importance of relationships for young children navigating these processes. The child interview rights practitioners' authorisation to act will derive from their registration with the scheme. This will allow them to provide the necessary advice, support and assistance even where the child is not in a position to instruct them. I am mindful that this process must be child-centred, so the authorities must consider the views of the child. Children should have a choice about who supports them, and practitioners must have regard to the views of the child in relation to the extent of the advice, support and assistance they wish, and the ways in which the child wishes to receive that. 
Ministers will make regulations in connection with the register how child interview rights practitioners are appointed, supported, paid and monitored. Practor partners have expressed a clear desire that individual solicitors on this new register are trained in child-centred and trauma-informed approaches. I agree and intend to make provision for this once the register is up and running. We are also exploring what further accreditation in this area might be appropriate. The regulation making powers in relation to the register are therefore deliberately broad. Clearly, I would expect also the review of the operation of the Act to consider how this new measure is operating in practice. It's worth noting that, as with some of the other provisions in this Bill, this is an entirely novel and innovative measure designed to further children's rights when the age of criminal responsibility is raised. I would therefore hope and ask that members support these amendments. The fundamental purpose of the role remains the same, but these changes make clear that protecting rights, age-appropriate practice and building trusted relationships are at the core of our approach. I move Amendment 113. Thank you. And I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Gail Ross. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm here to speak against the amendments in the name of the Minister around the creation of a child interview rights practitioner. And that is because the principle of independent advocacy has been hard won, not just in this legislation, but in legislation throughout the history of this Parliament. I was very involved outside of the, uh, being elected in the development of Section 122 of the Children's Hearings Act of 2011, which creates the right to independent advocacy for any child coming before the children. Panel. It seemed to me a, a happy synergy um, that this was being replicated in this bill and, and did so without the need for third parties to lobbyists to, to put it in. I am very dismayed to see it rode back. Why am I dismayed in this? Well, it's important because advocacy is defined in law. And the Scottish Independent Advocates uh, Alliance referenced the various places it's defined, but they, up to them, um, describe it as being a way of helping people to have a stronger voice and as much control as possible over a situation. They won't make decisions for the person they're supporting, but it helps them to obtain information and communicate their, their wishes and their views. I will. Oliver Mundell. I, I recognise the, the points he's making, but does he not also recognise the importance of children having access to uh, legal advice, uh, particularly uh, when uh, their rights and, and liberty might be affected? Alice Cole Hamilton. I absolutely do, but I don't believe that these two things are mutually exclusive. And I think the importance of the, uh, the provision of advocacy, as it is in protecting children in other parts of legislation, needs to be continued into this one. Um, it is really important that children's views are represented. And actually, in the, the tenets of this bill, in the amendments before us in the name of the Minister, actually talk about the fact that the independent children's rights interview practitioner has to... Um, has to have regard to the views of the child. If you're an advocate, you don't just have to have regard to the, the views of a child, you have to act for those views. You have to represent those views. We've got a, a really important distinction here between working towards a child's best interests and actually hearing their voice, because those two things might not always be the same, but the child still has a right under section, uh, Article 12 of the UNCRC to be heard in their own voice, and an advocate proposes to do that. That is why we can't support these amendments. Thank you. And I call Gail Ross. Mr. President, officer, I would like to thank the Minister for her work on this. And I welcome these amendments. Uh, they ensure that the term advocacy worker is replaced with child interview rights practitioner. And if we look back to the Law Society Stage 3 briefing on child interview rights practitioners, they said the introduction of such provisions should help to secure the consistency of practice regarding provision of advocacy services. And it's, uh, we, we should actually make clear that the role's fundamental purpose is not actually changed by these amendments, but the changes to the operation of the role make it clear that protecting rights, building trusted relationships and wider professional confidence are at the core of this approach. Now, these amendments also seek to make clear the qualifications expected by setting out they will require to be registered solicitors. And it also allows Scottish ministers to establish a register of these persons who are authorised to carry out that role. It will make sure that the solicitors on this new register are trained in child-centred and trauma-informed approaches. And this emphasises the importance of protecting children's rights and interests when an interview takes place. 
And as the convener of the cross-party group on ACES, I've heard a lot, as we all have, about the evidence about the benefits for our services, especially the services that deal with children, to be trauma-informed. I also welcome the decision-making powers given to the children themselves. So these amendments are welcome, in my view, essential, and I urge the Chamber to support them. Thank you. The Minister to wind up in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I want to reassure the Chamber that these provisions are only used in very exceptional circumstances where serious um, harm has occurred. And in that situation, as Oliver Mundell said, it is entirely right that a child should have legally qualified support in the room at the time that they are being interviewed. But that person giving them legal advice should also be child-centred in their approach. The change of name is simply to reflect that dual role that the person will be both child-centred and legally qualified and in fact was requested by um, the children's hearings advocacies who asked for this change to preserve their own identity separate to this in children's hearing advocacy. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. This is the first division in a group, so it will be a one-minute vote, and members may cast their votes now. This is a one-minute division. It's Amendment 113. The result of the vote on amendment number 113 in the name of the Minister is yes, 113, no, 4. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendments 52 and 53 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Amendments 52 and 53, the member to move or not move? Not moved. Those are not moved. I call amendments 114 to 130, all in the name of the Minister. Minister to move amendments on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object if I put the questions on amendment 114 to 130 on block? No one objects. Therefore, the question is that amendments 114 to 130 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 54 to 57, all in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Mr. Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Those are not moved. I call amendments 131, 132 and 133 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move on block. Moved. That is moved. Does any member object if I put these three questions on block? No, that is good. The question is that amendments 131 to 133 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 58 to 69 in the name of Alice Cole Hamilton. Mr. Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Those are not moved. I call amendments 134, 135 and 136 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move on block. Move it on block. Thank you. Does anyone object if I put these three questions together on block? No. no one objects. The question is that amendments 134 to 136 are agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 70 to 77, all in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, the member to move or not move? Not moved. Those are not moved. I call amendments 137 to 142, Minister to move amendments on block. Moved on block. Thank you very much. Does any member object if I put the, quest the question on amendments 137 to 142 on block? 
did not. So the question is that amendments 137 to 142 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to group six. Children's hearings, duty to consider need for further report. Can I call amendment 154 in the name of John Finney, grouped with amendment 143. And I would point out that if amendment 154 is agreed to, we cannot call amendment 143 as it will be preempted. So John Finney to move amendment 154 and to speak to all amendments in this group. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I, I move Amendment 154 in my name. I, I'm not on the committee that's uh, um, been responsible for scrutinising this bill, but I've followed its progress with great interest, and certainly of late I've done a lot of reading about it. And uh, people will know that uh, in the previous session, Mary Fee was the, the convener of the, the Equal Opportunities Committee there, and uh, I hope that we work jointly to advance the cause of children's rights. Mary's concerns that we were not getting it right for every child prompted her to introduce section 63 of the bill at stage two. And it's a concern that I share. However, I've also reflected on the response this section has prompted from agencies such as the Scottish Children's Support Administration and the Children's Hearing Scotland. Um, I therefore can't support section 63A staying in the bill and will be supporting the uh, Minister's Amendment 143 to remove it, should that be required. But I hope that's not the case. Uh, the debate around this issue has brought out the need to assure and make clear the powers and opportunities that exist within the hearing system to seek information and any assessments or reports that will help better decisions be made about children who require support. I welcome the Minister's intention in our letter to do more in this area, but I, I think we can go further and that it would be helpful for everyone working to support the needs and best sense of vulnerable children for this parliament to go further by bringing forward amendment 154 i seek to offer a positive solution around which i hope we can all agree my amendment equips children's hearings with the tools to gather the best information possible it means that child-centered individual assessment of needs at children's hearings can be carried out by supported by whatever information they consider necessary and relevant this could include the types of reports outlined in section 63a but I think it's crucial that we do not limit what sort of assessment or information might be short sought. Surely that should be decided based on what a child's individual needs are and which are relevant to the circumstances and, and challenges in a child's life. I have some concerns too about the focus on what appears to be a medical approach in this section. I've met a lot of reporters in my time, indeed many people who provide a great service serving as children's panel members. They do a fantastic job. And, uh, in the vast majority of cases, hearings will get it right. But if we can help them get it right for all children by putting something helpful into legislation, I think we should do that. That's what this amendment seeks to do. Thank you. Thank you. Could I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 143 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Section 63A was introduced to the Bill at Stage 2 by an amendment lodged by Mary Fee. It introduces a compulsory psychiatric assessment for any child whose conduct is a material consideration in a hearing. At the time, I made clear my concerns regarding the potentially damaging consequences of this section. A number of partner agencies have since come forward to voice their grave concerns at Section 63A's negative effects, questioning whether it is ever appropriate to mandate psychiatric assessments. They raise the likelihood of significant delays for children as well as for the hearing system and damage to child and adolescent mental health services through the additional demand on resources. I understand that a majority of the committee supported this section at stage two because of a genuine concern that hearings need access to the best information possible about children's needs. I agree. That's why I've committed to reviewing and strengthening the children's hearing rules of procedure as well as guidance and training available to panel members. I want to be absolutely certain that panel members have the best tools available to aid them in decision making and that they know when and how to use them. I also welcome John Finney's amendment. It provides clarity that a hearing must consider whether they need more information and has a statutory right to require it. I believe it's a balanced and proportionate approach and the government is happy to support it. The unintended consequence of Section 63A as it currently stands is broad and highly damaging. It would have an extremely negative impact on Scotland's children and the systems which support them. And I am certain that is not what Mary Fee wants, nor indeed any member. I hope that consensus can be achieved around my proposed approach in conjunction with John Finney's amendment. 
I note that if um, my amendment falls, if Mr Finney's amendment is agreed to. However, if John Finney's amendment is not agreed to, it is absolutely essential that Section 63A is removed from the Bill. I hope that members will support my amendment to do so, on the basis that further work will be undertaken in this area to strengthen the rules, guidance and training. Thank you. Can I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Oliver Mundell? Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank John Finney for bringing forward this amendment? Mary Fee's intention when she brought forward <coughs> the amendments at stage two was to ensure that when children's, uh, children are uh, 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 within the process, that an assessment is made of their ability to understand both the consequences of their actions, but also the proceedings that they're involved with. That was what went to, uh, was at the very heart of, of the amendment she brought forward there, and, and it was her intention. However, I do understand the concerns there are about framing it in a, a medical context so exclusively, which is why I think John Finney's amendments are very useful. I think they uh, uh, capture uh, the uh, purposes and the intent with, uh, with which Mary Fee brought forward her amendments at stage two, and it's why I would be, will be uh, very pleased to support them uh, when we come to vote on them. My one note of caution, though, is, as I speak, is I do think we need to be careful about uh, descriptions of uh, uh, psychiatric assessment wholly in negative terms. There is a right and proper place for psychiatric assessment. Indeed, sometimes that will be the relevant uh, information and assessment that a children's hearing will require. Um, and indeed, as someone who uh, sees a psychiatrist uh, once a year as part of my ongoing management of mental health, I would certainly want that message to be heard loud and clear. But, but I'll be very... Uh, uh, yes. Minister. To be absolutely clear, as somebody who worked in mental health for 20 years myself, it is the mandatory nature of these assessments and the broad-ranging universal nature of them that I object to. Of course, people in psychiatry do great work. Daniel Jones. I, I very much welcome the, the Minister's clarification. It's extremely uh, useful. I, I was essentially just uh, putting my uh, very predictable tuppence worth on that particular issue because it's very important to me. Uh, but with that, I'll close. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I certainly was convinced, and I know other members uh, on the committee were convinced by Mary Fee's uh, arguments at the time, notwithstanding uh, the concerns the Minister had raised, because we hoped uh, that it would mean that at this stage something workable would come forward. Uh, I think the proposal from uh, John Finney uh, in his amendment is uh, workable uh, and will address the concerns. We wanted to make uh, absolutely sure uh, that there was no circumstance in which uh, children would go into the hearing system with any less rights uh, than they would have if they were appearing in court. Um, and getting uh, the right reports and evidence to make an informed decision uh, certainly is something that, that we can support. Um, and if uh, that doesn't pass, we will support the Minister um, in removing an unworkable provision from the Bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Fulton McGregor. Hey, thanks, President Officer. And I just want to uh, speak very briefly as well in support of John Finney's uh, amendment and the Minister's amendment, if that's required. At stage two, I had serious uh, reservations um, about Mary Fee's amendment. And I, I don't think that... Um, that she, she would have wanted the, the unintended consequences. I think that Daniel Johnson has articulated uh, that really well, but for, to have a mandatory psychiatric assessment um, was just something that, 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 that I was um, really opposed to. And, and I, I went down the line of the re-traumatisation uh, of children, and perhaps it could be expected that children that are perhaps getting involved in um, the justice system and, and offending behaviour of a sort, um, it could be expected that they have maybe faced trauma in their own early years, and I was really worried about the possible re-traumatisation. So um, I know that that wasn't Mary Fee's um, intention, and we seem to have moved on from then. And I support both John Finney's amendment and the Minister's, if it's required. And I call John Finney to wind up in this group. Thank you, President Officer. I'll, I'll be brief. I, I want to thank Mary Fee for raising this originally there, and, and I certainly um, concur with it. There's no suggestion other it was, was well intended, uh, and it's uh, it afforded us the opportunity to, to, to clarify that uh, we can better meet the needs and interests of children, and certainly there should be no stigma around any of the ports that are required, whether they're psychiatric or otherwise. Um, that's as a, a bill should be, and I would urge members to, to, to support it. If they don't support I hope they will join me in supporting the Minister's amendment on the basis that she's promised to do more work on this through the rules and guidance uh, for the hearing system. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the question is that Amendment 154 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed.
And that preempts Amendment 143. Therefore, we move to Amendment 145. I call Amendment 145 in the name of the Minister. To move Amendment 145, Minister. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 145 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 155 in the name of the Minister. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 155 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 96 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Alex Cole Hamilton, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 146 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 146 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 78, 79 and 80 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Member to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 147 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 147 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 156 in the name of Ruth Maguire. Ruth Maguire to move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 156 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 81 to 84 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Those are not moved. We turn now to Group 7. I call Amendment 85 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, grouped with Amendment 97. Could Alex Hamilton speak to or move Amendment 85 and speak to all the amendments in, or both amendments in this group? Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendments in this group in my name. Uh, I recognise that the hour is late in their submission, but so too was the conversation that precipitated them. I had a, a meeting with the Minister and her team, uh, which concerned me greatly in terms of discussion that we had around the implementation of this bill. They suggested that due to training requirements by Police Scotland, there could be a significant delay in us even implementing a new ACR of 12. Um, that was news to us. We had taken no evidence whatsoever from Police Scotland suggesting there was a problem or a delay would be necessary in terms of uh, the point between Royal Assent and the point at becoming uh, live at 12. The Minister said in her own remarks in Group 1 that we want to raise the age to 12 now. Well, let's do that now. It's important to recognise that um, we have failed the international community's expectations in what the amendments we've failed to pass today. Let's not go further, compound that failure still further, and allow people as young as eight to be held criminally responsible for the next potentially 18 months or more as we uh, finalise the commencement of this procedure. We recognise every institution, every organisation that we took evidence from at stage one said they were ready to implement 12 now. I can't see any other reason for delay other than prevarication, other than the uh, government's um, lack of will so to do. We are already long grassing any future reform here. A review that reports in three years won't see meaningful change for another two thereafter. So we won't even achieve the de minimis position of international expectation for at least five years. Let us not compound that by remaining at eight for the next year and a half. Thank you. I call the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Friday, I set out my intention to move as soon as possible to start making a difference to children's lives. Should Parliament support the bill today, children under 12 will benefit quickly. We will ensure that no child under 12 is treated as an offender beyond autumn this year. We'll make sure we recognise and respond to victims' needs, and our intention is to deliver part two of the Act within 12 months of royal assent. But as we have seen with the debate today around key measures in part four, there are significant complexities around some key changes to this legislation. There is a need to ensure that there are adequate resources, guidance and training in place prior to commencement. We cannot put children, communities and victims at risk by rushing into changes without being certain that all responsible are ready to make the new law real in practice. 
Alice Cole Hamilton. I'd be grateful, I'm grateful for the Minister giving away. Can she give Parliament an assessment of when she expects part one to finally be implemented and the new age of 12 established? Minister. So an implementation group has been established to take the required work forward as well as delivery groups to advise and develop how we put the law into practice in key areas of this bill. Through these amendments, Mr Cole Hamilton is seeking to commence parts one and four of the bill on the day after Royal Assent, knowing that that is impossible to deliver. This would simply put children at risk. None of the required preparatory work with key partner agencies could be completed within that timescale. It would be hugely irresponsible for this parliament to put children and professionals in such a position. Within part four alone, there is secondary legislation to be drafted and laid. There is guidance to develop and consult on. There is training to be undertaken. There are sheriff court rules to be changed. And importantly, there is work to be undertaken to protect the interest of victims. Victims need to know that there are still processes in place which will investigate incidents of significant harm appropriately. We must provide them with reassurance that when harm has happened to them, it is still going to be meaningfully investigated and addressed. We will not su succeed in securing long-term confidence for this fundamental shift in our approach to children, or indeed in any other shift we seek to make in future if we do not take the time to get this right. We need to take people and communities with us. And on that basis, I strongly encourage members to reject amendments 85 and 97. Thank you. And before uh, Daniel Johnson wishes to speak and uh, Alice Cole Hamilton will have the chance to wind up, um, but we're just running out of time again. So Minister Marie Todd in this case, could I, I minded to accept a motion without notice to extend uh, the time limit by another five minutes? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that we extend decision to, well, our time limit by another five minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. I call Daniel Johnson. Briefly, presiding officer, I'd like to just begin by reassuring uh, Alex Cole Hamilton that defending the government is not my usual MO. But in this case, I think uh, everything that the minister said is, is absolutely correct. Notwithstanding the fact that there is significant amounts of uh, uh, guidance that needs to be drafted and changes that need to be made, preparations, there is also the fact that the, the police themselves are, are requiring legal clarification over key provisions in this bill. It would therefore be extremely reckless to, to commence this bill straight after Royal Assent, which is why we'll be supporting uh, the government in rejecting these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll call Hamilton to wind up. Well, I, I'm just very dismayed by what I've heard from the presiding officer. This is, let's remember that our journey towards increasing the age of criminal responsibility was started by the United Nations in 2012. That back then, Aileen Campbell as minister committed within the life of that parliament to get us to this stage. We didn't, we failed to pass amendments in the name of my friend and colleague, Alison McInnes, at stage three of a bill in 2014. But as a proviso against that, the government established a review which took three years and did all the work that we've described, ascertained all the changes that need to happen in our institutions, and reported two years ago. It's taken two years to get to this point, and yet we are long grassing this potentially for another two years. I think it's an absolute outrage, presiding officer, and we'll certainly continue to press these amendments. The question is that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. This is the first uh, vote in the division, so it'll be a one-minute vote. Members may press their votes, press the buttons now. This is Amendment 85. 
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 85 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 6, no, 114. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is, sorry, I call Amendment 97 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. That is not move. I call amendments 86 to 89, all in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Mr Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Those are not moved. And that ends our consideration of amendments. Now, at this stage, members will be aware that I am required to understanding orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In my view, this bill does no such thing. Therefore, it does not require a supermajority at stage three. So we're going to move on to that stage three uh, debate. And uh, just for members' information, decision time will now be 5.45. Okay? Decision time will be 5.45 this evening. And we'll move on to the stage three debate on motion 17169 in the name of Marie Todd on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. Can I invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons? And I call on the Minister Marie Todd to speak to and move the motion in her name. Presiding officer, in the words of Dr Seuss, a person is a person no matter how small. And this bill on the age of criminal responsibility is unashamedly about and for Scotland's small people. It represents a bold and radical shift in our approach. This week in particular, we should recognise that devolution enables us to forge a different path. When we raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12, Scotland will be leading the way in the UK. And unlike some of our international neighbours, there will be no exceptions in Scotland. Presiding officer, no child under the age of 12 in Scotland will ever again be arrested or charged, be treated as an offender, or have any childhood conviction follow them through life. During the bill process, we heard moving personal accounts from adults of the consequences of convicting young children. They told us of the need to do things differently. As James Doherty of Scotland's Violence Reduction Unit put it, you will never punish a young person into a better way of being. You can only love and nurture them into a better way of being. That is what this bill seeks to do. It is a strong statement of intent that when young children cause harm, we still treat them as children. We will protect their interests and support their needs. We will no longer let their life chances be damaged as they grow into adulthood by disproportionately disclosing information. Along with the Management of Offenders Bill and the forthcoming Disclosure Bill, we are about to see a fundamental shift in the way that we view the actions of children and young people. As part of this work, we have introduced an entirely novel concept into our care and justice system through an independent reviewer. They'll provide safeguards on the future disclosure of information about the behaviour of a person in their childhood. This bill makes a number of such innovative reforms. It embeds children's rights throughout its measures, particularly where a child is believed to have been involved in significant harm. We've provided powers for public agencies to investigate such incidents, but in doing so, we will ensure that children's well-being is a primary consideration, that children have access to independent, child-centered advice, support and assistance, will receive information in age-appropriate ways, have a right to appeal and be protected against the unnecessary keeping of forensic samples and prints. I recognise that some wanted this bill to go further in raising the age, and I hope that the establishment of a statutory review to consider the future age of responsibility shows Parliament's and this government's intent in this regard. We have already committed to incorporating the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child and will do so through a bill in this Parliament. Once finalised, General Comment No. 24 will be considered in its entirety as part of that work. But let me be clear, our approach to this bill is not simply about building popular support. It is about building confidence. We are determined that children will no longer be treated as offenders. 
That requires a meaningful departure from adversarial criminal investigative techniques and experiences. The police powers in the bill are intended for use only in the most exceptional circumstances where the seriousness of conduct under investigation is very grave and the circumstances of the case mean that the powers are the only way of getting to the truth of the matter. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the Minister for giving me and I do thank her for her previous clarification but does she accept that once this bill passes should it do so assume that a further clarification on the powers that the police have when there is no welfare concerns and is short of, of that uh, 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 criterion of harm is required and will the government commit to doing that prior to commencement? Marie Todd. I do and that's why there's detailed provisions to support public agencies to make this higher age of criminal responsibility work in practice. We have listened to and responded to the concerns of key partners during the bill process, but it isn't enough to simply change the law. We do need to shift practice and culture too. It's essential for the success of this reform that it's carefully and responsibly implemented. Delivery groups have already been established on investigations, victims and disclosure, as well as broader work to provide general principles and guidance to support professionals. The Scottish Government has positive obligations under the European Conventions on Human Rights to maintain an effective system for the investigation of crime and the rights of victims. We cannot put children, communities and victims at risk by rushing into changes without being certain that the responsible agencies are ready. And where there is an incident of significant harm, in those... Liam Kerr. Just very briefly, I think that that's quite an important point about not rushing into anything, but doesn't that lend credence to the idea that we should put the police powers piece back to stage two just to check it over? Marie Todd. No, I think we have made very careful assessment of what is required so far and we will continue to make very careful assessment of what is required going forward and work closely with our partners in the police force to do that. Where there is an incident of significant harm in these exceptional and grave circumstances, we cannot, we, we frontline social workers and police officers must be confident in how they can respond. When something exceptional and grave has happened, the public must have confidence that we can keep them safe. But most of all, when something exceptional and grave has happened, the victim, who is often a child themselves, needs to know that what happened to them will be taken seriously and the truth established, no matter how old the person was who harmed them. Part three of the bill stands on its own with one single section setting out the circumstances in which victims may request information. That's quite deliberate to make clear that we recognise that victims' interests matter and must be considered sensitively and appropriately. Presiding officer, I believe we've got the balance right. This is landmark and groundbreaking legislation and I look forward to listening to what members have to say in this stage three debate. But as we mark 20 years of our Parliament, we should know that today we have a chance to do something truly historic. In 1932, the Children and Young Persons Scotland Act raised the age of criminal responsibility from seven to eight. That age has stood for 87 years. Today, I hope we will agree to change history and vote unanimously to change that. I move that the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill be passed. I call Oliver Mundell for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think today is one of those odd debates where actually at stage three, most of the debate has already taken place. Um, I think we'll find uh, at decision time that, that, that there is uh, consensus across the chamber that, that we should move to 12. I understand uh, there are uh, members and, and, and parties within the chamber who would like to see things go still further. Uh, but I do think it is a bit of a stretch uh, to, to talk about this being a sort of bold uh, moment um, or uh, really to, to connect it to, to devolution, uh, given the, the sort of uh, separate legal position we've had in, in, in Scotland. Um, but uh, that, that said, the Scottish Conservatives remain uh, content as we were at stage one uh, to support the approach 
uh, the Scottish Government have pursued in this bill, uh, albeit for uh, slightly different uh, reasons. Uh, whilst uh, technically complicated in places as we've seen, um, and I've certainly, uh, as a member of the committee, will be interested uh, potentially in inviting uh, the Police Federation in to hear from them uh, after the legislation has been uh, passed, if it is passed today, uh, to, to really understand uh, what the concern uh, have, have been um, and, and when uh, those concerns were brought forward um, and, and how they've been considered. Because I think it is important in terms of post-legislative uh, scrutiny uh, and the reputation of the committee and the parliament uh, that we understand uh, what, uh, the, what the confusion in, in this case has been. Um, but uh, you know, whilst it's complicated in places, in our view, this bill uh, is at its heart a simple attempt to tidy up the law in this area. Uh, we recognise the fact uh, that the age of criminal prosecution in Scotland was raised to 12 uh, some years ago, which means uh, in practice that cases involving younger children are already sent to the children's hearing system instead of uh, to court. Uh, far from being a new approach, uh, these changes arguably, in our view, instead reflect uh, a significant change uh, that was made in policy uh, some time ago. And most of the rest of the bill is about making uh, th those changes a reality uh, and making them work on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis for the many stakeholders uh, involved. Uh, from the evidence received through the consultation and committee stage of the bill, uh, we believe there is uh, a good uh, argument uh, for these changes uh, and uh, that the stakeholders uh, that I've just mentioned, uh, wider society uh, and indeed uh, victims uh, are ready, capable and generally accepting and convinced uh, of the need for, for modest change. As I said in the stage one debate, uh, these changes are also uh, supported uh, by the, the Law Society um, who recognise that 12 is an age uh, that does already have significance in Scots law. Um, and I think from some of the remarks we've uh, heard today, it's possible uh, to miss that point and to think it is an entirely uh, arbitrary age that uh, the minister's just magicked up. Uh, but uh, it is an age uh, where uh, children do gain uh, new rights and are understood to have significantly more uh, capacity already uh, within our legal system. And I think it does uh, better reflect international standards. Uh, like other members, I think it is important uh, to look at what's happening elsewhere around the world, elsewhere in Europe, in other comparative legal systems. Uh, but I think that can never be the only consideration. Uh, I think it is important uh, that our legal system does reflect the views and values of people living in the country. Um, I think it's important uh, that we do listen uh, to victims of crime uh, and that they have confidence in changes uh, to the legal system. And also, uh, I think we have to listen uh, to those within our criminal justice and other agencies, because if they're not confident uh, that they can deliver changes, uh, then it's all very well and good uh, people in this parliament arguing for them. Uh, but uh, it is remembering uh, that sometimes uh, what looks good in legislation, uh, what looks good in black and white uh, on a piece of paper uh, can actually make things uh, worse in practice. Uh, but we, we, we do think uh, that it is important uh, and that most people would recognise uh, that those uh, under the age of 12 uh, should not be uh, simply uh, labelled and treated uh, as offenders for the rest of their life. Uh, but that has to be balanced uh, against a robust system uh, that does tackle serious harm. And uh, in this bill, uh, we think the right uh, balance has been struck. Uh, and that is why uh, there will be a uh, broad uh, consensus. And there will always be those who argue we should go further um, and faster. Uh, but um, we've got to look at the evidence um, and I would refer any members who are in any doubt uh, or uh, anyone uh, further afield watching uh, these proceedings to, to go back and look particularly at what the Lord Advocate had to say when the committee took additional evidence at stage two uh, that was uh, very powerful uh, and uh, compelling. And I think the committee was uh, right. I, I certainly uh, was keen that the committee did take uh, that additional evidence. But having taken that additional evidence, having indulged uh, members of the committee who, who really wanted to push uh, on these issues, it, it then seems somewhat odd uh, to, to ignore uh, what has been said. Um, I'm also, uh, President Officer, as I close, 
uh, very mindful uh, of what uh, victims uh, will think um, and I'm pleased uh, that my colleague Annie Wells uh, will set out some uh, of our thinking in that area in more detail. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think in some ways what Oliver Mundell said at the beginning of his remarks is right. This is a, a moment where having dispatched the, the, the amendments, much of the debate has happened. Um, however, what I would acknowledge is that we only get to this place through a great deal of collective effort. So I would like to acknowledge that collective effort uh, made by, amongst others, the Qualities of Human Rights Committee, the Independent Advisory Group on Minimum Age of Cor uh, Criminal Responsibility, the Scottish Children's Reporters Administration, but most importantly, all the, the children and young people who so bravely shared their experience of what it's like to be a person uh, involved in the criminal justice system. And I think we must have them at the forefront of our minds as we debate this bill this afternoon. So at the outset, I would like to state that Scottish Labour welcomes this bill, agrees with its objectives and the balance it, it, it strikes, and will be supporting it uh, th this evening. This bill aims to find an appropriate balance between protecting children from the harmful effects of criminalisation and also ensuring that incidents of harmful behaviour uh, by those under the age of 12 can continue to be effectively investigated and uh, responded to appropriately. But let's be clear, and I, I heard much of what Alex Cole Hamilton said uh, in the, in the, the, the uh, debating of the, the Stage 3 amendments, and I understand his uh, frustration. Uh, the reality is, is that it's uh, 12 years since the, 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 the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recommended that 12 be the minimum internationally acceptable standard. It is a, uh, a, an invidious position that Parliament finds itself, having had that update of, of that recommendation while this process was underway. And it's one, in some ways, that I, I wish we weren't in. However, change needs to be handled uh, carefully, which is why I think that we uh, need to stick to, to, to the age of 12. But we must be mindful that it's taken Scotland over a decade to, to comply with that. And that's something that I think we should have at the forefront of our minds. So while Scottish Labour welcomes this overdue change to raise the age of, of criminal uh, responsibility from 8 to 12, we believe that this legislation does require clarifications. That's why we were pleased that the government supported uh, the majority of our Stage 3 amendments. And again, I would like to place on the record my thanks for their constructive engagement through that. Uh, and I think in particular, um, uh, the bill has now been sig uh, significantly clarified regarding um, the places of safety and police powers. These changes will ensure that a police station is only ever used as a place of safety when absolutely necessary and when adequate checks have been carried out. These changes will improve the clarity and reassurance to our hard-working police officers who quite easily could be put in a very difficult and invidious position uh, through the passage of this bill. It will enable them to discharge their duties, not just to young people, but the wider community more confidently. But I must also um, deal with, with that wider point of confidence. And the Minister pointed to the required confidence that this bill, this act, must have. But the reality is, when it comes to the police, the Scottish Police Federation, and the Association of Police Superintendents of Scotland, there is still a gap in that confidence. And that is one that needs to be filled and the government must bring forward a written clarification after detailed consultation on those. Because the reality is, as I detailed in the Stage 3 amendments, there, is, there are situations where young people cause damage or are other acts such as graffitiing, vandalism, theft from shops. And if they haven't had prior contact with the authorities, there is no reason to believe that they will continue with that behaviour. I still am not clear on what powers the police will have to take that common sense approach of putting a hand on their shoulder and returning them home. At least there is a doubt in my mind that there may be the possibility for those parents to, to complain. I, I will give way in a moment. Uh, you're uh, in uh, your last minute, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Um, so I would urge the government to come forward and extinguish this ambiguity because it is a dangerous uncertainty. Those complaints, even if it is a, a for a period of time that this grey area pertains, that those complaints could take a great deal of time to wash through the system. Also, the government must consider the interactions with other elements of law. Uh, I think failure to provide this clarification will place our police officers in a very difficult position 
indeed. And I think it's in a sense a shame that the government has not exercised its uh, uh, right under Rule 9.8, Section 6 of the Standing Orders to send this back for further Stage 2. I will be following up following this debate, writing to the Lord Advocate, asking for his views on both the status uh, of, of these powers in conjunction with other elements of the law. A and indeed, whether or not there are, is any question mark, whether or not uh, police officers could be uh, charged with abduction if they return a child home against that child's will, where there are no further concerns. So Scottish Labour is committed to preventing our most vulnerable children and young people from being exposed to the harmful effects of the criminal justice system. But this bill does have shortcomings, and this, uh, the government must bring forward clarifications prior to commencement. Thank you. Call Alex Cole Hamilton for four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The Minister has used throughout the course of this debate words like radical and historic and bold. This bill is none of those things. And it is, in fact, a dismal day for all of us. It's a dismal day for the Scottish Parliament. It's a dismal day for Scotland's children and young people. And I find it hard to put into words the anger and disappointment I feel at the missed opportunity in this legislation and the realization that we are actually living in a far more socially conservative country than I had hoped. The scales have fallen from my eyes. So if you'll permit me, I'll use the first part to lean on the words of somebody else, and that is Lindsay Hanvidge, who I referenced in the group around place of safety. Lindsay said to our committee, the first night I went into care was in May 2007. There were loads of police outside the flat where we lived and, in, and social work was there. When I went upstairs, they told me that I, my brother and my sister were getting taken away from my mum. I kicked off a little bit and I told them I did not want to leave my mum. My mum was going to be left by herself. They took my behaviour as harmful behaviour as I was just kicking off. That is how it felt to me, as if I was just kicking off for the sake of it. They put my, me in handcuffs in my mum's house in front of her and my brother and my sister. I was 13, my sister was six and my brother was 15. They took me out of the house. I was not even dressed properly. I remember having jammies on that, on that had a hole in the back. I did not realise that they were the ones I'd put on, but they still had me cuffed at the front and they were forcibly removing me from my mum's house. I got my first charge that night. When I got to the bottom of the close, they were pulling me about the place. I was quite a weak girl when I was 13 and I hit him. It was just I wanted him away. I wanted to get back up the stairs and make sure my mum was okay. I got taken to the police station that night. This happened at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I was not picked up until about half seven this, the next morning. I was taken to a children's home where my brother and my sister were. They had spent the first night in a children's home. I spent my first night in care in a prison cell, locked up. I had done nothing wrong. It felt like I had done something wrong. That was my first experience of being charged or being involved with the police. And that was them taking me to a place of safety. It did not work out for me that way. Presiding officer, we have failed. We have failed Lindsay Hanbridge. And there is nothing in this bill that would have changed her story, either the age at which she was charged or the incarceration in a cell as use of place of safety. And I think it is an outrage and a, a stain on this parliament's reputation that we have against the better judgment of the international community who intervened twice in the conduct of this legislation, who intervened twice and were rebuked and rebuffed by this minister who said that we have some sort of sense of moral exceptionalism, which does not frankly exist, and yet we are found wanting in terms of the de minimis expectations of international precision. Minister, I believe your government will come to regret the timidity you have shown today, the goodwill that you have and your party have built in laudable policy change in, in areas like the age of leaving care in other aspects of child protection will have evaporated after today, after you did not heed the call of witness after witness, organisation after organisation that said we had an international imperative to get to 14. How can we, if it's going to be five years before we get at the very earliest the opportunity to change this again, waiting three years for a review and then the resultant legislation to pass? How can we stand in judgment over countries like Russia or like China over their human rights abuses when they have higher ages of criminal responsibility than we do? I do not believe that we should celebrate the passing of this bill. You're clapping a deficient piece of legislation and failed ambition. More children will suffer because of this inaction. I hope it isn't another 80 years before we get to remedy that. I will be 
voting for the bill tonight. Frankly, because, as I said in my opening remarks, the, uh, this government has presided over an age of criminal responsibility in its decade in office, which is frankly medieval. But I do, know, do not do so with any joy tonight. We now move to the open debate. Can I warn everybody, we're really tight for time. Uh, you must come in at under four minutes, and I may have to shave some time off with closing speakers. Um, so I call, first of all, Ruth Maguire to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Presiding officer, I strongly believe that raising the age of criminal responsibility to 12 is the right choice for Scotland at this time. Raising the age of criminal responsibility in Scotland from 8 to 12 is a milestone on the road to making Scotland the best place for children and young people to grow up. Minister Marie Todd's recent announcement regarding setting up an expert advisory group to consider the further challenges to change in the future is to be welcomed. I want to acknowledge the passion, drive and expertise of those voices outside of our Parliament who wish to go further than 12 and say that I accept that the job of Parliament is one of leadership, particularly when it comes to equalities and human rights. However, children, communities and crucially victims should not be put at risk by rushing into changes without being certain that the responsible agencies are ready. And leadership is also sometimes about acknowledging challenge and practical considerations for people on the front line. We have to have the confidence that victims, communities and professionals share an understanding of what works when a child causes significant harm. And whilst we know that many of the children involved in harmful behaviour have often been subjected to trauma, we mustn't forget that the victims of this harmful behaviour will often be vulnerable children themselves. When we call for trauma-informed approaches to addressing those engaged in harmful acts, we must ensure that the same is true for victims. I've recently written to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice regarding a five-year-old child in my constituency who is the victim of a very serious sexual assault perpetrated by a 13-year-old. The response to him and his family has not been trauma-informed. Indeed, the actions of the authorities have added stress and additional trauma to an already intolerable situation. I understand why the family does not feel like justice has been done. I understand why they feel that our current system has failed them. Victims must receive appropriate support that does not re-traumatise them. And equally as importantly, they need to have confidence that what happened will not happen again to them or to anyone else. Criminalising children does not work and does not guarantee a stop to harmful or offending behaviours. In fact, it's much more likely to lead to further harm. However, we must do more to hear the voices of victims and their families. And in doing that, we'll contribute positively to the power of work that's necessary, that's needed to take the communities we represent on this journey with us. I would ask the Minister in closing to say a little more about how we can do just that and ensure child victims receive their rights. Their right to an effective remedy to the harm that's been done to them including confidence that the systems we have in place will ensure what happened to them won't happen to others. Increasing the age of criminal responsibility will not only benefit children and young people, but Scotland as a whole. It is a strong milestone on the way to making Scotland the best place for children and young people to grow up. I'll be proud to vote for it this evening, presiding officer. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, presiding officer. A number of speeches so far have spoken about the nature of this legislation uh, being overdue. And I think it's worth pausing to reflect that uh, the comment that the minister made about the length of time since the age of criminal responsibility was increased from seven until eight. And during the period of that 80 plus year uh, span, uh, all of the parties in this chamber, with the exception of the Greens, have at some stage held the wheels of government and been in a position to be able to affect the change that we are now seeing to date. So while it may be overdue and it may be something that needed to happen before to date, I do believe the Minister uh, has been the one to take this forward and see it through and for that she deserves credit and congratulation and we should reflect on the journey that has taken us to this point. Now I had hoped um, in the amendments that we might go further but we did not but I do believe that the Minister's Amendment 145 does afford uh, a chink of light in relation to the possibility of future change. However, I do believe that that will need to continue uh, the pressure will need to continue whether from within the chamber or outside uh, at some point in the future to ensure that that is seen through and I would also say that 
I hope that the Minister would accept that some of the work around overcoming or beginning to overcome some of the technicalities which stood in the way of raising the age to 14 could perhaps be ironed out, addressed and looked at before it gets to the stage of reviewing the legislation so that you could decouple those processes. While the review of the legislation, I think, does need to give the legislation some time to take effect for it to be a, a, a positive and useful review, the work to uh, establish how to overcome those technicalities doesn't necessarily need to wait for that review to take place in order for that uh, to be taken forward. I also think that it's very important that when we uh, look at the guidance that will be produced around police cell use um, and places of safety, there has to be a robust analysis of that guidance and, and work needs to be very carefully undertaken. Good intentions have been expressed in this chamber, but it's very important that those intentions translate firmly into the text of the guidance, because at the end of the day, it will not be the intentions that have been expressed in this chamber, which will be followed by those who are expected to administer the legislation. It will be the guidance that is produced to back it up. Finally, presiding officer, I think that the process through which we have considered this legislation and indeed the debate gives us an opportunity, I think, to reflect on the wider understanding of the nature of justice. I think all too often in the debates that we have, whether in this chamber or in wider society, justice is often seen by some as a means by which to slake the thirst of vengeance. Uh, and all too often we lose sight of the fact that justice delivered for victims uh, is important, but justice delivered for those uh, who find themselves affected by trauma, uh, who find themselves offending at a young age uh, as a result of that trauma is also important as well as part of this process and ensuring that the justice that they require in order to enable them to still realise a positive future as a, as a result of interventions is just as important as part of this, I feel. And that's why I think the approach that the government has taken is correct. Uh, the approach that's been taken uh, in terms of future review is correct. And that's why I'll be happy to support this legislation this evening at stage three. Annie Wells, followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a member of the Equality and Human Rights Committee, I have been following this bill closely from its inception. And the evidence is persuasive that offending behaviour in children can have its roots in emotional trauma, and to criminalise children under 12 causes more problems than it solves. We therefore will be supporting this bill, which also makes the law easier to understand at the same time. However, we want to stress that we will always put victims of crime first. The Scottish Conservatives recognise that adverse childhood experiences can lead to offending behaviour. And with Scotland currently having the lowest stage of criminal responsibility or ACR in Europe, we agree it should be raised from eight. The committee heard evidence that highlighted a large number of those under 12 who had offended had already been, been facing prior disadvantages and adversity in their early, earlier childhood. It is therefore only right that this is taken into due consideration. Consideration for the rights of the child, however, should always be balanced with the rights of the victim. This is why the Scottish Conservatives have been clear that the ACR should not be raised higher than 12. And the age 12, as we've heard, isn't just a random figure. Bear in mind that the age of criminal prosecution was raised to 12 in 2010. The bill is in many ways an attempt to align the two, which, with children aged between 8 and 12 already prevented from prosecution in criminal courts. I have also been clear of the need to have the public's backing, and I do believe that an increase of four years is already a significant step. The public needs to retain confidence that serious incidents will be dealt with appropriately so that victims feel supported. And this is particularly important given Police Scotland's caution against raising the age higher than 12. And this was on the basis that the nature of children's actions and the prevalence of that behaviour changes as the age groups increase to 12 and above. And this is why at stage two, the Scottish Conservatives put forward amendments that would try and make information more readily available to victims, particularly in cases involving a death, and allow the Lord Adv Advocate to play a continued role in cases where behaviour gives rise to wider public safety concerns. We continue to hold the belief that the government needs to address the gaps identified in victim support. At the moment, the information available to victims is limited, with Community Justice Scotland also expressing concern over how quickly this information becomes available. 
It is vital for victims to know that action has been taken so that they know that harmful behaviour by a child has been taken seriously. And this is an emotive bill. And throughout this process, I have tried to put myself in the shoes of families affected by serious and harmful behaviour at every step. Deputy Presiding Officer, this has been an extremely interesting debate over the last few months, and to be part of it has been compelling. It's, and to be part of it has been great. And it's been compelling to hear from all sides their views on raging, raising the ACR. And I want to put on my record my personal thanks to the committee clerks, witnesses and members of the committee who have worked so hard and been so passionate about this issue. Whichever way we look at this bill, the need to have a wider discussion on prevention so that children do not find themselves in, this, in these unfortunate positions in the first place. Ultimately, I believe the Scottish Conservatives have taken a balanced approach, one that recognises the roots of crime and emotional trauma with the rights of victims. Thank you. Ian Gray, followed by Gail Ross. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Earlier on today, uh, you, I and a couple of other colleagues uh, spent some time reflecting on the 20 years of the, the Parliament for a, a BBC documentary. And we spoke then about uh, it being a new and modern Parliament and uh, in what ways it was different. Uh, one way in, in which it is, I think, uh, new and modern, which we didn't talk about, is that uh, we are a Parliament whose work incorporates uh, the European Convention on Human Rights and has done from the very beginning. And indeed, over 20 years, we've gone beyond that into the active promotion of rights in Scotland uh, and uh, most notably uh, the development of a system of rights-based education. And I think most of us will have been uh, to schools in our constituencies to see them presented with awards as right -respecting, rights respecting schools. In my own constituency in East Lothian, uh, two of these human rights defenders, uh, Hannah Richardson and Cameron Butchart uh, from Windigo Primary School, through their work with the Children's Parliament and the Streets Ahead Trinent uh, project, uh, actually found themselves in Geneva presenting to a United Nations uh, workshop on the rights of the child day. And I know that uh, similarly, two young human rights defenders from elsewhere in Scotland uh, are, I think, this week or next week, giving evidence to the UN Committee uh, on Torture as, as well. Another initiative uh, of this Parliament in its past 20 years, uh, of which we can be proud, I think, is the creation of the post of a Children's Commissioner, one which didn't exist uh, back in 1999. And one of the campaigns the current Commissioner has prioritised is indeed the incorporation of the United Nations Convention uh, on the Rights of children and it is I think something of a failure a collective failure uh, that uh, we have not uh, incorporated UNCRC given that the parliament began with this idea uh, of the incorporation of rights and in truth I guess the most egregious example of that is the fact that for so many years the age of criminal responsibility has indeed been so low not just low but internationally uh, low now I know that the program for government uh, announced at the start of this session uh, 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 included a commitment from the First Minister to incorporate the principles <coughs> of UNCRC and that her, her conference uh, last week uh, she committed to incorporate uh, uh, the United Nations Convention uh, 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 completely and that is all welcome but it's unfortunate then I think that we find ourselves in this position where the international minimum age of criminal responsibility shifted from 12 to 14 in the course of our uh, legislating. Uh, and really, we should have been fleeter of foot, I think. Our own uh, lateness to, to this did mean, uh, I think in practical terms, that a jump from 8 to 14 was too much uh, in one go, although 12 alone would not have been enough. So in the end, I think 12 with uh, a review towards raising that is probably the best in practical terms. But truly, presiding officer, this isn't our finest hour. It, 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 this really does need to be addressed seriously and not allowed to slip uh, any uh, further. I don't think today is as dismal as uh, Alex Cole Hamilton said, but I really think the minister over exit if she thinks this is a, a, a day of historic triumph. Uh, we should be careful 
to be claiming to meet the gold standard in children's rights. Mm -hmm. uh, this bill takes us in the right direction, uh, but we should have moved further long ago. The last of the open debate contributions is from Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. And I would also like to add my thanks to those of other members, to the many groups and individuals who have contributed to this process of developing the bill that we have before us today. And the opportunity presented to us today will see vital work begin to raise the age of criminal responsibility in Scotland to 12, a step in the right direction that recognises the progressive direction of travel that we are on. And whilst many have argued we should immediately be looking to increase the current age of eight to 14 or even higher, this bill does set in place the necessary legislation that will enable future increases when the time is right. I welcome the Minister's announcement that a group will be set up to monitor how this can be done with everyone's safety, security and well-being to the fore. And there will be plenty of people and organisations watching and I know the Scottish Government will bring proposals forward as soon as is practicable. During the Stage 1 debate, I highlighted the different speeds at which children develop and the need for us all to recognise how damaging it could be for a child to be held criminally responsible. I believe that many of us have gone on a journey with consideration of this bill, a journey which has made us reconsider the purpose of how we treat children within our judici judicial system and realising that young children who offend should be treated with a welfare-based approach. Do we simply wish to punish some of the youngest members of our society? Or do we want to adopt the approach required to protect our young people in some particularly challenging situations? We are not saying that every act committed by a child should be ignored, but we can certainly do much better in both minimizing societal harm and improving the life chances for all the young people involved, including victims of crime. This bill before us today makes significant steps towards achieving these aims and by increasing the age of criminal responsibility to 12, we do need to look at raising it further to at least 14 to bring us into line with the minimum internationally recognised age as outlined by the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. I made my opinion on this very clear during all stages of the process and that view has not changed. I warmly welcome the commitment of the First Minister, who last week announced her intention for Scotland to make sure that we are meeting the UN's gold standard on children's rights. I look forward to the launch of the consultation, which will outline how we will achieve this, and ultimately look forward to the day that we incorporate the UNCRC into Scots law. We all want Scotland to be the best place in the world for our young people to grow up. This bill will help us realise that goal. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and can I take this opportunity to remind members that if they're taking part in the debate they should be here for the entirety of the opening and the closing speeches. And I call Daniel Johnson for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I always feel when you have to make that comment, they're, they're about to miss out. Um, but so I'll, I'll give it a good go. And indeed, I'm going to uh, begin by, I think, uh, highlighting the words of uh, Ruth McGuire, um, because I think she's absolutely right in pointing out that we must be mindful of the benefits of this legislation, not just the benefits to the young people themselves, but to wider society. Because I think, as Annie Wells, I think, uh, uh, very well illustrated, the issue at the heart of this is that the young people's experiences of the criminal justice system can be the very traumatic events that lead to those adverse childhood experiences that puts them on that cycle, that, 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 that uh, uh, um, unavoidable consequences which uh, fundamentally alters their life and the course of their life. And sitting on the Justice Committee and having had a, a great deal of contact in the last year or so uh, with the criminal justice system, visiting prisons, uh, working uh, with third sector organisations that, that work with people with experience of prison. That reality is very clear and I think this is a positive step to preventing some of those people entering into that, that cycle. So this is important, it is welcome, it is beneficial, not just to those people but to wider society. But I think Ian Gray is absolutely correct in his analysis in, in terms of we must be careful not to trumpet this as some great triumph. 
Yes, this parliament has done a great deal in terms of recognizing rights, putting rights at the heart of our policy making. But as he pointed out, the, the UNCRC is very clear about the minimum age of criminal responsibility, and this bill does fall short. And I think we need to think with great care about how we move forward for here. And we need to bring people with us. And we need to do so in a considered way, in one that, that makes things work. And I think that Alex Cole Hamilton was absolutely right to uh, read out the words of Lindsay Handridge, because if in the end of the day that, that taking someone to a place of safety just feels like they have done something wrong, if there is no difference in terms of experience, regardless of what the law may or may not say, then this will not have worked. Which I think does take us neatly on to, I think, the very well-made point by Mark MacDonald, that, that this will really uh, succeed or fail in terms of the translation that goes forward from the, the good intention that is very clear within this bill and how that is translated in terms of guidance, in terms of the systems that are put in place, the training, making sure that, that, that what is practiced at, at, in wider society, the way that this uh, bill is implemented is going to be absolutely key to preventing those adverse childhood experiences from reoccurring and simply not just being relabeled or rebadged uh, through this. That, that is what we must uh, take great care to. And indeed, indeed, I think this bill does strike that balance. The, the review looking at the age of criminal responsibility, which is embedded within this, is correct. Having an independent reviewer, I think, is a strength of this bill. Uh, you know, and, and indeed, some people have talked about um, the, the great store and weight that we've put in the children's reporter and children's panel system as, as potentially uh, being exceptionalism. And I, and I don't think it is. I think Scotland took a very brave and bold step forward in terms of implementing the Combrandon uh, principles many years ago. But in so doing, I think as we move forward, we must uh, protect, uh, I think, the very sensible and robust structures that those principles And I do have an ongoing concern about the children's reporter system and making sure that it does deliver on the intent um, with which it was created all those years ago. But, but finally, this does come down to confidence. And, and indeed, I think a great deal of what we do in this place, both within the criminal justice system and beyond it, is about confidence. Confidence of, of uh, people and our communities that the justice system will act in a proportionate way and keep them safe and confidence of the people who are uh, within it that it will serve their interests and treat them fairly uh, and, and give them opportunities uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to avoid the experiences that they might have encountered that brings them there. And with that, I will close. Thank you. Call Liam Kerr. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to close for the Scottish Conservatives and confirm that we will be supporting the passing of this bill at decision time tonight. The key issue that the bill seeks to address is that the minimum age at which a child can be held criminally, criminally responsible is currently eight. And as many have pointed out, it was set in 1932 and is the lowest in Europe. But if it is not to be eight, then what age should criminal responsibility B. Well, the bill's second principle is that the age of criminal responsibility should be 12, and the Scottish Conservatives are persuaded that that is the correct cut-off point. As Annie Wells pointed out, the age of criminal prosecution was raised to 12 in 2010, so children aged between 8 and 12 are already prevented from being prosecuted in the criminal courts. And furthermore, Police Scotland have cautioned against higher ages. In the committee's report, they said that the nature of children's actions and the prevalence of that behaviour changes as the age group increases to 12 and above. I also find it persuasive that, as Margaret Mitchell flagged up in stage one, the number of incidents currently reported as involving under 12s offending is small and reducing. And also, as we heard earlier, the Law Society point out that children aged 12 and over already have a different status. They can make a will, consent to or veto adoption, they have sufficient capacity to express views on future arrangements for their care, instruct a solicitor, and it's the basic age at which children start secondary school. And finally, I think it's important to note that, as Oliver Mundell said, 12 appears to be the publicly acceptable age that has both professional and public confidence. It is imperative that any change such as this can command the public's backing and Daniel Johnson and Ruth Maguire were clear, we must take the public with us on this. 
As Annie Wells said, the public needs to retain confidence that serious incidents will still be dealt with appropriately so that victims feel supported. And the minister said during the amendments earlier, victims need reassurance and that harm is still meaningfully addressed. We must take people and communities with us. She's absolutely right. And it is vital that when this change is made, the Scottish Government reassures the public that harmful behaviour by under 12s will still be dealt with and it will be dealt with in a manner proportionately to the harm caused. President Officer, I also want to pick up on something Oliver Mundell alluded to at the outset, that we must monitor the Act's implementation for unintended consequences. And this is particularly important here because of the impact on police powers. Now, earlier today, we debated amendments which have been raised as issues just last week by the Scottish Police Federation. The implication is that Officers dealing with children under 12 years old who are causing risk or significant harm to others but who aren't an immediate risk may be deterred from being able to look after them properly. Now, Daniel Johnson decided not to press his amendment earlier today and Parliament chose to reject it when I did. But even had it passed, I think it would have still left a potential gap. So it remains a concern and possibly leaves open outstanding issues in relation to places of safety and a financial memorandum that may understate police implementation costs by over six million. Now, I heard the Minister's reassurances, but I also hear that the SPF and Police Scotland remain dissatisfied with the answers. And I don't like having to make that call at stage three when trying to decide whether to pass what is, in its core principle, an important and necessary piece of legislation. It looks to me at least possible that the government may have missed something and the committee may have failed to garner all the information it needs to decide on the best drafting. And if there is the remotest possibility that something has been missed, which could restrict the police in the execution of their responsibilities, my view remains that the precautionary principle mandates that it be put back for further examination and evidence taken by the committee. So I was very pleased to hear Oliver Mundell's suggestion that the committee might be able to hear more. And Daniel Johnson, I thought, gave a good legal route which could uh, resolve this. So I strongly hope the minister will take that counsel and I'd be grateful for her remarks on that later. However, I accept it is vital that we implement these reforms because we've heard compelling evidence throughout that the current age of eight for criminal responsibility is no longer sustainable and that 12 is an appropriate age at which to set criminal responsibility, including on the basis of agency, legal precedent, public acceptance. So for that reason, presiding officer, I again confirm the S uh, Scottish Conservatives will support the age of criminal responsibility Scotland Bill at decision time tonight. Now call Marie Todd to wind up the debate for six minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If we were debating a bill today to create a minimum age of criminal responsibility, I doubt very much if we would choose for that age to be eight. But I don't think we would be agreeing unanimously to make it 14 or 16 either. That tells me that this bill to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12 gets it right. I have to say I agree with Oliver Mundell, who quoted the Lord Advocate's evidence was absolutely compelling in the extra evidence sessions at stage one. And I have to say, I'm saddened to say it, but I think Alec Cole Hamilton weakens his own arguments by ignoring that evidence and by comparing us in Scotland to countries with a human rights record like China. We've achieved, no, I think I've heard enough this afternoon. Yeah. We've achieved a consensus in this parliament on this issue that was unimaginable uh, uh, excuse to me, Minister. years ago. Can we stop with the rudeness, please? Thank you very much. It's inappropriate to shout from behind from a sedentary position. Mr Swinney, I'm dealing with this. We have Mr Cole Hamilton, I would appreciate it if you would not talk back to the presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. Presiding officer, we have achieved a consensus in this parliament on this issue which was unimaginable to most a few years ago. We have clearly been on a long journey to do the right thing on this issue, but along the way this government has reformed policy, law and practice. In 2011 we raised the age of criminal prosecution to 12. 
In 2015, we published our first youth strategy, justice strategy, and we continue to advance the whole system approach to preventing and addressing offending by young people. We've seen a remarkable reduction in proceedings against young people, including a reduction of 81% in the number of children being referred to the children's reported on offence grounds. So we have spent the last 10 years doing the right thing for Scotland's children and young people. And I want to pay tribute to all of the ministers who have helped to do so, including Adam Ingram, Kenny McCaskill, Angela Constance, Michael Matheson, Aileen Campbell, and Mark MacDonald. I also want to thank the Equalities and Human Rights Committee members for their detailed scrutiny of the bill and to everyone who provided written and oral evidence. Excuse me, Minister. Excuse me, Chamber. I'm finding it quite difficult to hear the Minister. If you could be a bit quieter, please, Minister. I want to express my gratitude to the members of the 2015 advisory group which set out strong and clear recommendations on raising the age and the measures needed to sit alongside that reform. These gave us a robust route map to follow as shown by how closely their recommendations are reflected in the bill that we seek to pass into law today. And I particularly want to thank the bill team and other government officials for their dedication and diligence. This has been a truly cross-government initiative, and I thank everyone for their thoughtful input and expertise throughout. But most of all, I want to say thank you to all of you in this chamber. The way in which we have conducted our discussions on the bill and reached consensus on crucial matters demonstrates to me and importantly to our constituents that we have all been determined to do the right thing. That's a strong message to send to our children and young people. And whilst we have made significant progress in recent years, this bill represents a vital missing bit of the jigsaw. I don't think that jigsaw is yet complete or else Parliament would not have agreed to undertake a review of the operation of the Act generally, nor to consider the future age of, of criminal responsibility. And I have already announced an advisory group that I will establish this summer, um, beginning work on that. And, and I would refer Mr Cole Hamilton to the evidence given by Anne Skelton, again in those extra um, evidence sessions, where she said, it would be an option to at least make clear in the pending legislation a future intention to raise the minimum age. That is what we have done. No, thank you. I know that some are concerned that because we have not locked down the minimum age of 12, we could go back to eight. So let me be absolutely clear. As long as the SNP is in government, there will be no going back. The age of criminal responsibility in Scotland will never be below 12 again. What I have sought to do with this bill is achieve the right balance. This legislation, the plan to implement it and the plan to review it all strike the right balance. That is the right approach for Scotland at this time. But there is momentum behind this reform and ambition for Scotland's children. In preparing for today, I revisited what children and young people told us at various stages of this bill process, including in Inverness, when I took part of one, in one of the consultation events held on our behalf by the Children's Parliament. Just be thoughtful, said a nine-year-old. Imagine if you stole a sweet and you couldn't get a job because of it. A 14-year-old suggested that at the age of eight, some kids don't understand right from wrong and the police should understand the background of the child, as I believe that every action is caused by a situation in their life. On what happens in childhood, another reminds us that people change over the years, so it shouldn't follow them forever. And finally, from this 12-year-old, we are all human. Treat us the same as you would treat others. Presiding officer, it was Nelson Mandela who said that there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Today, I hope that Parliament will support this bill and show our children and young people that we are committed to treating them with dignity, respect, fairness, compassion and humanity. 
I am very proud as the Minister for Children and Young People to move that this bill be passed. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. The next item of business is a committee announcement. Can I call Gillian Martin, Convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, to make an announcement on the report on its new inquiry into the report of the Committee on Climate Change. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. As Convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, I welcome this opportunity to update the Chamber on both the Committee's recent work and its future plans and what is the biggest environmental and societal challenge that we face, which is climate change, particularly in the light of develop developments last week. The Committee concluded its consideration of the Climate Change Bill and reported it Stage 1 in March. However, before the Committee moves to the amending stage of the Bill, we agreed to consider and report on the advice on climate change targets from the UK Committee on Climate Change, or the CCC which was released last week on the 2nd of May. This advice, published in light of the Paris Agreement and the IPCC Special Report released in the autumn of last year, recommends that Scotland should now set a target for net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases by 2045, provided that UK-wide ambition is raised to net zero by 2050. In our Stage 1 report, we recommended that the Bill should reflect the most ambitious targets set out in the advice from the CCC, and a revised climate change plan be delivered within six months of royal assent of the bill. Therefore, we welcome the Scottish Government's speedy response to the CCC advice. On the same day as the CCC advice was published, the Government lodged a package of amendments to the bill and the First Minister committed to update the climate change plan in line with our schedule uh, recommendations. These amendments, if agreed at stage two, would implement the CCC's advice by setting a target date of 2045 for net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases and increasing the levels of the 2030 and 2040 interim targets to 70% and 90% reductions respectively. Increasing our climate change ambitions offers clear potential for innovation, jobs, the economy, the environment and for the well-being of the people of Scotland and beyond. And so we welcome this government's quick and decisive action on this. We also recommended in our Stage 1 report that the Bill's journey through Parliament be timetabled to accommodate thorough and detailed scrutiny of the CCC's advice. Therefore, we plan to hear evidence from the Committee for Climate Change next week and then from the Scottish Government before hearing from two panels of stakeholders to explore their response to the CCC's advice, the impacts of that advice and their views on the Scottish Government's response. Our committee will then produce a report drawn from these sessions before moving into the amendment stage. As all members of our committee have agreed, we need to raise our ambitions to tackle what is the single greatest, greatest threat to our existence on this planet and what is the most significant intergenerational justice issue of our day. With the CCC's timely advice and the government's swift response, we welcome the opportunity to explore how we do that in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. We're going to turn now to decision time, and there's only one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 17169, in the name of Marie Todd, on the age of criminal responsibility Scotland bill, be agreed. And because this is an act, we should cast our votes. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17169 in the name of Marie Todd is yes, 123. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill is passed.
Thank you very much. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on to members' business shortly in the name of Bruce Crawford. But we'll just take a few moments for some of the members and the minister to change seats.